Good morning. Uh, welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, before we begin, I think it's important to recognize, at least for those of us who are Nats fans and still basking in the warm glow of victory, the wonderful game that we all watched last night. So uh, let's hear it for the Nats. Um, so this morning I would like to begin by thanking everybody for their support as I'm transitioning to the role of acting chair of the agency. Uh, Anne-Marie, I want to thank you for all the years of effort and leadership uh, and guidance that you've given us and certainly wish you well for the future. I look forward to continuing the work, the important work of protecting consumers with the help of my colleagues, my fellow commissioners, as well as the outstanding staff here at CPSE. We have one item on the agenda this morning, and that is a decisional matter on the fiscal year 2020 operating plan. We have a staff member sitting at the table, uh, Mr. Dwayne Ray, who is the Deputy Executive Director for Safety Operations, but lurking in the audience behind is Jay Hoffman, who's the Director of, of uh, Financial Management, and James Baker, who is our Budget office, Officer, and I want to thank you all for being here. So we will begin with questions for the staff. Each commissioner will have five minutes for questions. We can go multiple rounds if necessary. Following questions for staff, we will then turn to consideration of the operating plan and any amendments, which I suspect there are a whole bunch, uh, for consideration. Uh, I will begin, and I hope to set a very good example. I have no questions. Uh, Commissioner Burkle? I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Kay? I have a couple of questions. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Ray, in 2017, when the commission uh, declined to terminate the recreational off-highway vehicle package and instead adopted an amendment <clears throat> that would require a retrospective review of the existing voluntary standard, it had four items to that retrospective review. Are you familiar with those four items? Yes. And in the proposed operating plan that staff sent up, there is a termination package. Is it staff's intention to cover all four of those items in the package that comes to the commission? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Thank you. And then if the commission were to change the allocation in EXHR on burden reduction and increase work associated with burden reduction, where in EXHR does that work come from? So for every staff month, that is moved to burden reduction, how can we understand what staff work will not get done? Um, it's a little specific on the particular project. So um, depending on the kind of work that was in the burden reduction, if it was heavily on, let's say, engineering, um, we would have to look at shifting staff months out of another engineering project that um, to support that work. Uh, but without the specific, um, you know, breakout, we. But in general, we'd find other projects that are planned, and we'd have to take resources away from those to fund any new project like that. Okay, so uh, if it were fiber-related, spandex, for instance, fiber. You know, you primarily got the, um, um, you know, our, our lab folks uh, some. Uh, some project management support with an EXHR. Um, so probably take some testing uh, resources away, I would guess, on that front. Okay, great. No other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Biacco? You microphone, so. No questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman? I have no questions at this time. Okay, having heard no further questions, staff is excused from the table. Thank you for your work and the work of all the other staff on this uh, operating plan. We really appreciate it. We'll now turn to the FY 2020 operating plan as proposed by staff and any amendments to the plan as it was proposed. Um, by my latest count, we have over 20 amendments to consider. Uh, while we will take as long as necessary to fully consider each one, I encourage everyone here to be cognizant of the time and to reserve debate for your highest priority items. Uh, I don't have any amendments to introduce, but I do have a brief statement. As my colleagues know, I had planned to introduce an amendment calling for an annual report on senior safety. 
to identify those products that disproportionately cause fatalities, injuries, and losses for older consumers. When I checked with staff, uh, I realized to my chagrin that the resource implications for such a project would probably displace one of the other reports already scheduled and designated in the operating plan. So again, trying to set a good example and stay within existing resources, I've withdrawn my amendment and I'm instead calling for a public meeting that will focus on senior hazards and I will share uh, my thoughts with my colleagues as, as they develop. I just want to go on record as saying my interest and concerns for seniors have not gone away and I certainly plan to introduce this pro proposal at a future date. And I, will hope, I hope staff will continue to look at other opportunities to highlight the risks faced by this vulnerable population of which I am a proud member. I now turn to consideration of amendments for the operating plan uh, and Commissioner Burkle, uh, if you have an amendment, uh, may we ask you to distribute that and describe it for up to three minutes. And then after the conclusion of your description of your amendment, I will call for a second. Thank you. Okay. As staff is distributing uh, my amendment to this uh, ops plan, uh, I'll just describe, and I am offering this amendment on behalf of myself as well as uh, Commissioner Biaco. Uh, this amendment is um, in FY 2020 or on page 17 under 23259 chemical hazards rulemaking activity under the subcategory OFRs add the following at the end in FY 2020 staff will present a staff excuse me a draft federal register notice to withdraw quote the guidance document on hazardous additive non-polymeric organohalogen flame retardants in certain consumer products. If withdrawal is approved by the commission, the corresponding frequently asked questions on CPSC's website will also be removed. I offer this um, amendment this morning uh, and I will make a few comments and then defer to my colleague as well to offer any thoughts she might have. Um, because First of all, this was commission-driven, this guidance document, so I believe that the Federal Register document would not require any significant staff resources, and it would require an approval by the commission. I think it's safe to say that in recent years there has been opposition to the use of guidance documents by the federal government. Just this past month, the president issued an executive order addressing the inappropriate use of guidance and directing agencies to reform their approaches to issuing guidance. Whether or not that executive order applies to us, which we debate on a daily basis, I think our OFR guidance exemplifies the type of guidance that is inappropriate and has attracted great criticism. It's not just a mere interpretation of our laws or our regulations. Instead, it is telling manufacturers, retailers, and consumers to stop making, selling, or buying this entire class of organohalogen flame retardants before we have gone through the process that our statutes specify. This is backdoor rulemaking that is creating such a backlash against guidance. At the very least, this should have gone out for notice and comment. As the executive order says, it isn't enough to include a disclaimer that the guidance is not binding. The simple fact is people assume that the federal government would not be telling us not to use certain chemicals if we didn't have a sound scientific basis for doing so. Now we talk a little bit about the National Academy of Science and what we have just received from them. The guidance document was clearly based upon the premise of the, the commission, not staff recommended, that we would look at this entire class of o OFRs uh, as a class and not in subclasses as, as the NSAS has um, suggested. But beyond this, this guidance was premature. It should have never gone up. And uh, it really, I believe, is an end run ru about rulemaking and should be taken down. Uh, and I'll ask Commissioner Biaco if she has anything to add. Uh, just a few things. Thank you, um, Commissioner Burkle. Um, and thank you for 
working with me to present this amendment. Um, I, it's my understanding that the guidance was issued um, before I, I came to the commission. And I, I do understand that it was not a staff document. It was, it was issued despite the staff's recommendation. And it did not, it was a guidance that was issued without going through the statutory process, which I don't support generally. Um, this is not, from my perspective, um, it, it, something that takes away something uh, that was put into place properly. Um, and in addition to that, it does not take away from any other work that the agency plans to do with regard to OFRs as described in this op plan and as we've discussed. Um, most importantly, it's incorrect. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences, of course, completed and shared the report this summer, and there are new findings and recommendations that are, that are not consistent with the information contained in the guidance document. I see no reason to keep something like that on our website uh, for public view when it is inconsistent with something we, uh, we paid and uh, waited for quite some time to have done. So um, I, I would support the amendment. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. And now we turn to questions about the amendment. I think we need a second. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Is there a second? Okay. Jumping the gun, as it were. Okay. Um, so, uh, Commissioners Burkle and Biacco, but let me turn the question to Commissioner Burkle at least at the start. I assume you agree that one of the main purposes of the Consumer Product Safety Act is to give stakeholders, especially consumers, information and advice on the safety of products they purchase. That's a statutory mandate. Uh, as I read your amendment, it would withdraw any guidance or advice from the Commission regarding the safety of OFRs with no clarification, no substitute advice, no nothing. So I guess my first question, and I would like to make it somewhat personal, if you had a next door neighbor or a good friend who came to you and said, I'm going to purchase a product and it looks like it's got OFRs in it, uh, what advice would you give them and where would you turn, ask them to turn for advice? Well, first of all, this amendment only suggests that we take down the actual guidance document and if it's approved, the, the uh, questions, the uh, frequently asked questions. It doesn't say we won't talk about OFRs. It doesn't say we wouldn't provide any information about OFRs. But my concern with this, this information that we have up is we do not know if it's accurate or not. We had a tech-to-tech -tech meeting where we heard from the industry and the electronics industry that the removal of OFRs in the electronic casings, we don't know whether or not that is going to affect the safety. And so while we want to also be concerned about OFRs and exposure to them, we also want to be concerned that the, the not using OFRs could create and could create more dangerous situations and increase the number of fires, particularly with electronics. And that has been my concern consistently since this guidance went up. Beyond that, I would say staff recommended we deny this petition. They denied, they suggest we deny this package. And the commission went out prematurely, I believe, prematurely with, I'll just say, uh, prejudgment as to whether or not these OFRs are safe. And I think we need to be concerned as an agency regarding that point. Uh, and I appreciate the thought, but I'll uh, ask it a, in a different way. If I were a retailer and I'm about to buy uh, products for this holiday season and I'm told that those products have OFRs, uh, where should they look for advice? To whom should they turn for a purchasing decision? In other words, if they've got to make a decision today about whether they're buying products that have OFRs, what should they do? Where should they go for advice? I would argue that to have inaccurate information up, which I believe the OFR guidance is, we don't have the facts and yet we go up as if we do. Taking that position is more dangerous than, than holding back until we do have the specific information we need in a subclass setting as NAS has talked about and the work will continue on these organohalogen flame retardants as to which ones are and which ones are not. But to make a blanket, blanket statement I think affects safety, especially when it comes to the electronic casings. Uh, yeah, but I don't notice that anything in your amendment says uh, withdraw it and ask staff to provide a more appropriate assessment of any advice that we should give. But people have to make decisions immediately about whether they're going to purchase products with OFRs. And I'm afraid the signal that we send to the world is 
uh, we take it back. We don't think that there's a serious safety hazard, which is absolutely contrary to what the NAS report assesses. And so uh, what we're stuck with is we either go through incredibly lengthy and detailed formal rulemaking, which is going to take years, or we're just left with a big hole. And I guess that's what uh, concerns me about this, uh, this amendment. Uh, and if you have any response to that, I'd appreciate it. Just once again, I think it's incumbent upon the agency to have the facts before we put out guidance. Guidance can be misleading. And in, in, I'll, I'll just say it again because I feel so strongly about it. The use of OFRs in electronic casings where there is minimal exposure to the consumer but a very, very uh, high benefit, I'll call it, uh, to the use of OFRs in electronics. I think it's irresponsible for the commission, despite staff recommendation, to put up this guidance without having the facts. We, it's an end run around rulemaking and it needs to be taken down. Uh, I notice that your amendment takes all the advice down, not just for the uh, electronic uh, plastic casings. Um, and so, uh, Commissioner Biacco, if you have anything to add, if not, then uh, I will turn to uh, uh, Commissioner Kay for any comments he has. Just one comment, uh, well, two actually. I, I agree with Chairman Burkle's um, assessment. I, I couldn't, or Commissioner um, Burkle's uh, assessment, and I couldn't state it betterly, frankly. So I, I, I would just second the, the comments that she made and, and add one more. I don't believe that the CPSE should be making any safety claims based on the absence of evidence. So um, we just throwing some stuff up on a website and giving guidance willy-nilly that does, isn't supported, isn't supported by our staff, is inconsistent with what our staff recommends, and is inconsistent with the very report that we commissioned, I don't think is a responsible uh, position to take. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, uh, Chairman Adler. And thank you to the amendment sponsors for offering this. I certainly understand the philosophical views behind it, and um, I'm not going to in any way try to talk you out of uh, a dislike of the process of guidances, because I don't think that would be effective. I would though like to address some procedural issues as well as some of the substance, and I guess I'll start with the substance. Uh, I don't think there's a, I just have a different view, Commissioner Bayako, that there's no evidence. I think actually we've heard overwhelming evidence that of those OFRs that there is data on, they have been shown to be highly toxic and that uh, we had the chief toxicologist at the time for the United States government come in from NIH and testify to that fact. And not only did she testify to the fact that there was abundant data of the toxicity of many of the OFRs, she also gave in her judgment the view that if the commission were to address any chemicals, and the question that I think then Commissioner Adler put to her was if you had our small budget and our resources and you had to prioritize these chemicals, of all the chemicals you're aware of, what would you go after first? And she said OFRs. And if anything, the NAS study confirmed that there is significant data about many OFRs and significant concern about them. So I would gently push back on the idea that there is no data. I think at that point it becomes a risk tolerance and a judgment call based on the amount of data that I think is indisputably out there. And uh, if we have to make the decision to, let's just say we're going to make a mistake. And our choices are to make a mistake by warning people about a hazard that turns out not to exist, or not warning people about a hazard that turns out to exist. I would every time turn, choose warning people about a hazard based on some data that turns out not to exist. I don't think that's going to end up being the case. I think what the most that might happen is some OFRs at the end of the day, either there might never be enough data on, or there might be some way at a molecular level to exclude those based on some computer projections or some exposure surveys or whatever you, what have you. But I do think that there's enough data. I do think that we can make that judgment. I think we, sh we made the right call. It, is, it does only say encourages and recommends. It's not a, a, it doesn't dictate any action. On the casings, I guess I heard it a little bit differently from the, menu, from the uh, electronic folks. I think what they're saying is that 
it would be too expensive to go up, come up with other ways of doing it, not that they couldn't do it, and that OFRs are the cheapest way. And I think what is unfortunately one of the uh, most under-discussed aspects of all of this is how much data has also been out there about it and how ineffective OFRs apparently even are from a fire prevention standpoint. And so what a shame it is if they don't even work to continue to expose children in particular and pregnant women to chemicals that they don't need to be exposed to. So I do think there's enough data. I think that the commission has made a reasoned decision to warn based on that. And I think it would be a massive step back for safety to take it down based on the reasons that were articulated. I also do want to just address one process concern that I have, and that is the lack of transparency associated with how this came about. Uh, I might be ill-informed, but my understanding is that this came about from phone calls from the chemical industry into the commission, and I'm not aware of any public record of that. I'm not aware of a, of a petition that was filed, which is the opposite of how this issue came to us, where it was filed in a petition by certain public health organizations for us to take action. And so I would, I think the public deserves to have a fuller understanding of how this came about and why the commission would be doing this and what would be the base of that. If there is, I might be mistaken, and if there is some public record of how this came about, then I'd like to see that as well. Thank you, no, no further questions or comments. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Biacco, since you're a co-sponsor of this amendment, it, it, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Feldman. You certainly would have a chance to make additional comments. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Um, the guidance that's the subject of the amendment that, that's before us right now preceded and predated my tenure at the agency. Uh, so looking at it retrospectively, I think, and listening to the conversation here today, um, I think there are some legitimate questions about the factual basis for the 2017 guidance. And I think that, uh, that, that, that in my view, the guidance has regrettably and inappropriately driven the consumer product manufacturers to veer away from OFRs. To Commissioner Kay's point about whether there's questions about the efficacy of OFRs as a class of chemicals and the fire uh, re retardant properties of the OFRs, if in fact uh, these chemicals don't work for that purpose, presumably the market would take care of that issue itself and manufacturers would opt for uh, uh, re re replacements and alternatives that, that, that function better. Um, that said, uh, I, I, I appreciate the, the amendment sponsors for bringing it forward and, uh, and, and look forward to voting on the amendment. Um, Commissioner uh, uh, Burkle, it looked like you had a quick comment to what uh, Commissioner Kay said, so I'm going to yield a few minutes to you to respond. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I just wanted to comment on a couple of things, um, and that the lack of transparency issue that uh, Commissioner Kay just raised. This is not something new. Um, I, I um, went on record when we, uh, when not I, but the rest of the commission voted in favor of granting the petition and went against staff's uh, advice and then beyond that put up the guidance document. I've been opposed to that since day one, since 2017. And so uh, I don't think there's a lack of transparency uh, on that front. There, this is something that I've been vocally opposed to and thought it was the wrong move for the agency and the commission um, since 2017. Thank you. Uh, reclaiming my time, I just had one or two additional comments. First of all, with respect to the hazards associated with OFRs, I think all of the evidence we've heard indicates every time we carefully and thoroughly study an OFR, it turns out to be toxic. Uh, I remember very well the hearing that we had on that in which I asked everybody there, including representatives of the industry, do they know of an OFR that has been thoroughly studied where the conclusion has been reached that they don't represent a toxic risk? And to the best of my recollection, nobody could come up with a single one. So I do think there's tremendous evidence of toxicity. And again, I rely on Dr. Birnbaum's testimony uh, from the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences on that point. And I think she is the leading toxicologist in the, the government. The big issue for some is that there are some OFRs where we have no data. But I do want to, or little data, I want to reiterate what the National Academy said about that. They said, you can't draw a conclusion that because there's no data, there's no risk. In fact, they said one of the 
advantages of adopting a class approach to assessing OFRs is that where you have those circumstances in which there's uh, not necessarily uh, sufficient data to draw a strong conclusion, they said at least those who are making decisions about manufacturing and those who are making decisions about distributing, retailing, and purchasing will have that information. And it should give people greater incentives to generate data to demonstrate safety, which has not occurred today. So I just want to reiterate, uh, first of all, I think we have information. I think we should share it. That's, that's the guiding philosophy of a lot of folks. Uh, if you don't have 100 percent data, you give them the assessment of the data that you have, which is what I think the guidance document does. Uh, and I simply want to say I oppose this strongly today, and I will oppose it strongly if and when staff brings back a Federal Register notice if this gets approved. Uh, Commissioner uh, Burkle, anything to add? Just to add to that, I think that the, um, the blanket statement that every OFR is toxic, I think that that reflects uh, just it, it, it's not good science and that even NAS, and you agree, you seem to be agreeing with a lot of what they have said to us, they said you got to divide this into subclasses. You can't, the 14 subclasses, you just can't look at these as a broad class of chemicals. But beyond that, we haven't talked at all about exposure and that's the piece we're missing. I mean, we need oxygen to breathe, but too much oxygen is going to kill us. We need water to live. Uh, too much water could kill you. So. It's, it's this exposure piece of OFRs is extremely critical and really relevant to this discussion. And just to make this blanket statement, I think, is where we get to the confusion and, and really the misinformation being put out by the agency. Thank you. Commissioner Kay, additional comments? Well, I didn't, I feel like Commissioner Bayako missed her turn to. Oh, I'm, I'm to sorry. Comment. You're right. Uh, and I just have a note. Uh, please call on Commissioner Bayako. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Kay, as well, because I do want to respond to a couple of the points that you raised. And you raised some very, very good points. Um, on the transparency issue, first of all, I, I can, at least for my office, uh, shortly after we had the presentation from NIS, uh, my staff raised this issue independently um, and, and pointed out that it, the, the guidance that was on the Internet was inconsistent. Um, we did, however, um, also receive a call, uh, and uh, I believe we, we have a meeting log, uh, whether it was filed or not. I have not, I can't represent that yet. Um, um, if it hasn't been, it certainly will be because it it's still within the time for posting. But I also point out that we had a very public meeting um, that was noticed in the public calendar. It was, uh, OFRs have been discussed quite a bit um, in, in, uh, with this agency and uh, there was a lot of activity surrounding that meeting with regard to the, to the report. And I think that uh, uh, one thing that you said is extremely important and that is there are many many um, OFRs and many uh, different variations of the data and uh, there's a sliding scale, if you will, of the risks that we have been or the NIS has been able to determine exist or don't exist. And as Commissioner Adler pointed out, I mean, his position is if, you know, you have no data, that doesn't mean um, that there isn't a risk, but the same is also true. If you have no data, that doesn't mean there is a risk or, more importantly, for um, our charge, an unreasonable risk. And in some regards, I do think that OFRs provide a safety benefit, which is, you know, one of their main purposes, is, and that's to limit fire. And I do agree that at least in um, uh, casings for electronics, I think they're important. And, and to follow up on Commissioner Adler's uh, hypothetical, I would tell my next door neighbor, hey, you know what, the data is not, not conclusive. In some regards, there have been findings. In other regards, there have not. And that is still being studied. And I, I, I don't think that it is responsible to say they're all bad or they're all good. Um, this is a, a guidance document that we put up on the internet ourselves. And I think we can certainly take it down ourselves when it contains um, information that is incorrect or inconsistent. Thank you very much. Uh, I would note that taking it down creates a, just a, a hole in uh, any advice or thoughts. And, and I see nothing in any motion that would say, let's do an additional assessment of risks and provide additional guidance. Are there additional comments uh, on this? 
Commissioner Kay. Thanks, uh, Chairman Adler. So just in response to Commissioner Bayako's comments, I'd be curious, you mentioned a few times there's inconsistencies, and could you spell out what those inconsistencies are, please, with the NAS study? Yeah, it's Thank my you. understanding that there are some classes of chemicals that, um, that, that we have been, or we, the NIS has been able to establish have more risk than others. And as Commissioner um, Feldman adequately points out, those types of chemicals, some have been banned and some um, uh, the market doesn't bear using them. But the NIS also indicated that they had different classes that either uh, had no data or that had some data that suggested there could be um, risks and the level of those risks and in what application have not been been discovered. So I, I think that there's a lot of inconsistencies. So I guess I would push back only in that the guidance just said based on the scientific evidence available, the commission believes that these could present a risk. And so I'm having a hard time understanding how's that inconsistent with what NAS said. In fact, if anything, I feel like what NAS said is entirely consistent with the guidance. It reaffirmed what uh, most of the toxicologists came in and testified to, which is there is a range of OFRs. Some have been studied, some have not been studied. Those that have been studied, to Commissioner Adler's point, have all been shown to be highly toxic. And so I'm still missing, I'm open to there being inconsistencies. I guess I'm just not seeing that there are inconsistencies. So my understanding is that our uh, guidance is sweeping across the entire class. And as you point out, the NIS did say there's a range. Some have been studied, some haven't been. Some, we have different uh, pieces of information. Some will continue to be studied. That is inconsistent with taking a position, uh, the blanket statement that they all are bad. I don't believe that's what the NIS said at all. Yeah, and I agree, and I don't think that guidance actually says they're all bad. I think it just says if you can avoid these based on what we know now, we would recommend that you avoid them. But again, I, I understand the philosophical um, motivations, and I do very much appreciate, by the way, the further comments on the transparency. I think that that's very helpful to know. Um, I, I guess at the end of the day, my sense of having been at the commission and working with the four of you is that for any of us, and this goes back to what Commissioner Adler was talking about, if we were home with a, we're almost, some of us could be grandparents, some of us are grandparents, a child, a grandchild, and we were aware of a very dangerous children's product, a sleep product, but it, staff had not concluded yet that there was a substantial product hazard, but there, we knew about a number of deaths, a number of incidents, and that family member went to go use that product with their infant. My guess is, even in the absence of staff conclusively having made a defect finding, we would all figure out some way, without revealing inside information, to not allow them to use that product because of our concern about the risk posed to that child based on what we knew at the time. And I guess I don't, if I'm correct, and I, I believe that, because I know all of you would step in, in an appropriate way to protect a child based on incomplete information, but alarming enough information. And I guess for me, the distinction, I can't figure out what the distinction is here when there's enough alarming evidence about OFRs that we wouldn't apply the same principle and what is different about that. And no one needs to comment about that. It just seems to me that knowing all of you that you would step in in one circumstance, I, I'm having a hard time understanding why that wouldn't apply. I have no more questions, thank you. Um, Commissioner Feldman, any comments or questions? I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burkle? Yes, I, I wanted to just uh, one point about this philosophical. This isn't philosophical. This is guidance that went up prematurely when the commission didn't have the information it needed to put out this guidance. I concur with Commissioner Biaco. This is far more sweeping than um, what what NAS mentioned to us and talked to us about, and I take all of that very seriously. But I do think the exposure piece is important, and I think it's also important for us as an agency to ask the question, why are OFRs used? They have a purpose. And if you're looking at UL standards and you're looking at some of the electronic standards, they require the use of OFRs. And so before we go off in a direction, and we shouldn't have done this in 2017, and we only add to the confusion now by taking this position, CPSC, and I've said this for seven years roughly, we're a small agency, we can be nimble. This, this should come down and we should 
be looking at this issue as we go. We've got recommendations from NAS. We're pursuing other avenues as an agency. The petition was granted, which begins rulemaking. And so, so many steps are being taken. This guidance should come down. It's not accurate. It was based on the granting of the petition was that all classes, all OFRs, are hazardous. We don't have the exposure material, and we know that not every OFR is hazardous. And to your point, yes, we would step in. But I also would step in if I knew that there was, a, whether it's a device or something else, that would prevent injury or harm. And I do believe that there is a, a well thought out, well, the benefit of the use of OFRs is something that we have disregarded. And the unintended consequences and the regrettable substitution could be something that this agency will have to deal with. And they're used to prevent fires, which is another issue that this agency is focused on, it is dealing with, and has tried to mitigate, certainly since I've been here, but since the beginning of the agency. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just one additional comment. Uh, uh, first of all, I think you said that uh, UL requires the use of OFRs. I think they require the use of flame retardants. Am I correct in that statement? Uh, the other thing is when you say we know that some of the OFRs are not hazardous, I'm not aware of uh, any OFR that's been declared not hazardous. I'm aware of OFRs that have been declared where we don't have data. Uh, but if you know of any OFRs that have been declared not hazardous, I would love to know which ones those are. I will look back and rewatch that hearing. Because okay, that sounds fine. Are there any additional questions? I, I just unfortunately have to belabor it a little bit longer and just say that um, I think that the science has not in any way shown that these have been effective. Any of the science that we've seen has shown that they've not been effective. But more importantly, the folks who are on the front lines, the first responders and the firefighters, have been leading the call for us to take action and to get rid of these. And so I would think that if anybody were concerned about fighting fire, it would be the firefighters. And I've never heard a firefighter ever defend an OFR. I've only heard firefighters beg us to get rid of them. That's the final comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burkle. Just, just a quick comment in response to that, and that is for, I, I don't even know how many years we've been uh, begged by not only the first responders, but industry and the consumer groups to, to adopt TB117 and to not use organohalogen flame retardants in furniture. And consistently, this body, this commission has said, no way, no how, it doesn't address fire hazards. So you cannot have it both ways. When I hear the words TB117, a chill runs through the crowd. And so I think I will leave that. Are there additional questions or comments? If not, uh, hearing no further questions or comments, we're now going to move to vote on Commissioner Burkle's amendment. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? I vote aye. Uh, Commissioner Kay? No. Commissioner Biacco? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Feldman? Aye. And I vote no. The uh, ayes are three and the noes are no. Uh, the amendment is agreed to. Uh, Commissioner uh, Burkle, do you have additional amendments? I do not have any further amendments. Thank you. Commissioner Kay, do you have amendments? I do. Shall I begin? Yes, I recognize you for your first amendment. I ask you to describe it for up to three minutes. And then after the conclusion, I hope I remember to ask for a second. Okay, thank you. Um, I think at this point we're all ready to be done, but now we get, we get going on more amendments. Uh, so my first amendment has to do with window coverings. I very much appreciate that um, there appeared in the package, a, in the draft package for the commission, an effort to try to deal with window coverings by proposing to lock part of the voluntary standard in via what we call Section 15J, or 15J, which is pursuant to Section 15J of the Consumer Product Safety Act, which in essence means that if there is a voluntary standard that we deem to adequately address the hazard and it's substantially complied with, we can enforce it. Um, I appreciate that there was, uh, that that was put in the operating plan. I don't want to get into the specifics of that, but my understanding is that was not something that came from the technical staff, and I think that's important because we're all trying to figure out how to finish this off, and this off meaning address, finally address all the hazards. And my amendment goes to trying to shift the work in the operating plan from the 15J to getting staff to 
publish a report on what remains undone in the voluntary standards capacity and what needs to happen. And one of my objections to the 15J approach is that it would lock in an arbitrary distinction between what are called stock window blinds and custom window blinds. So the difference between going on to a website or walking into a retailer and just saying, I'll take that one in the box versus designing your own is how I see it roughly. I think it's more complicated than that, but that's roughly how I see it. And we don't say, for instance, that, and by the way, all the window blinds present the same strangulation hazard. We don't say with cribs, if your crib is made out of less expensive wood, we're going to regulate it one way, and if it's made out of more expensive wood, we're going to regulate it the other way. We just don't ever distinguish products like that, as far as I can recall. And I don't know why we would do this. Staff never agreed to uh, segregate by stock versus custom. They always wanted to do it differently and address the hazards at the same time. And so I want to get back. I think we should get back on that road and use the limited resources that we have. And so my amendment would push us back in the direction of addressing the remaining hazards. Thank you. Is there an, a second to this amendment? Second. Thank you. Um, we will now engage in questions and comments, and I will begin. Uh, I support this amendment. Uh, I see some benefit in doing a 15J rule, but I think the confounds that Commissioner Kay has described make it very difficult to proceed in that direction. And I just want to thank Commissioner Kay for his many, many years of leadership on pushing safety for window cords, including pushing me a lot. Uh, I only have one small concern that I would like to raise with you, and that is uh, the public uh, understanding of moving from an NPR designation to a DATR data analysis uh, does not in any way suggest to me, and I hope to you, that there is a lessening of the agency's commitment to safety for window cords. So I just ask for a word of reassurance to our stakeholders that this changed designation carries no such lessening of safety. Well, to the extent that I can provide that assurance, sure, the intent here is to actually refocus the resources on solving the rest of the hazards as opposed to um, sort of going over ground that's already been covered in the voluntary standard. Uh, thank you very much. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you. Uh, I just have a lot of questions about this because um, this approach, I think, fails to give recognition to staff and to the industry as to how far we've come since I've been at this agency. And the distinction between custom and uh, stock products, I think, occurred while you were, uh, while Commissioner uh, Kay was chairman. So I'm concerned about trying to understand the, the desire now to move away from that distinction. But I guess my first question would be how how does taking this out of a 15J advance safety? It seems to me we now go back to just this. We, we have come so far with the voluntary standard. And when, when we first looked at addressing stock versus custom products, it was, look, if we can get through the, the stock product first, we are going to be addressing a significant portion of, of the hazard here, and so let's start there. Uh, it's kind of analogous to my TB117, where we would at least take care of the smolder standard and then move on to the open flame. At least we're advancing in the correct direction. And so, so much progress has been made on this issue, and staff deserves so much credit on this, that I'm just con concerned and confused, quite frankly, why we wouldn't embrace the 15J, because that levels the playing field that any products coming into this country will have uh, a clear marking as to whether or not it's customer stock and, and readily observable whether there's a cord. I mean, the, the ANSI standard and what's improved in that standard, really, it, it's, I think that most importantly to your point about looking as to whether it's customer stock, one of the provisions of the new standard, and I met with WCMA, I think that many of us did uh, in the last few weeks, and asked them, provide me with a list, because this standard doesn't just address stock. This new standard, which is in effect since December of 2018, also affects custom products. Now, um, and I think this is important. Manufacturers are now required, pursuant to the new standard, to mark either stock or custom product in the headrail. So the consumer will know and understand. But beyond that, the custom product in the, in the, 
the current standard that's in effect right now, there's a default length for operating cords to 40% of the blind height, default to tilt one instead of tilt cords, new requirements for cord joiners, new requirements for tests for rigid shrouds, new more explicit warning labels, enhanced testing for tension devices. It seems to me we're like setting that all aside and we're gonna go down this path. 15J is a concrete way for us to know whether or not this first voluntary standard is working, how effective it is, and then we can move on to see whether or not, and I believe we will, and we will open the custom standard and we will get there. But as we're doing this and we're taking this time, the market is shifting. There's probably when we started talking about this, 10% of the market were custom cordless products. That now has shifted to 40%. And so this problem, I think, will, will help and resolve itself as well. But I'll give Commissioner Kay time to res respond. So just so I'm clear, what specific question am I responding to, please? <laughs> I didn't know if you had any comments to my, <laughs> to my um, profound remarks. They, well, they were very profound. I, I guess I, I don't see this setting aside anything. In fact, I think it accepts the progress that was made and it says let's now finish it off. And so, uh, yeah, great progress was made. Uh, Canada has now passed regulation that has not gone into effect that would not delineate between stock and custom. It would cover all products. I think that was is a wise approach. Um, to your point, the more that custom products, you said it went from 10% to 40%, I think you said, so the more that custom products are out there, the more the marketplace that's unaddressed in terms of the actual strangulation hazard. And so, um, yeah, I don't think not doing a 15J in any way is either disregarding the progress that has been made or um, not acknowledging anything. I think what I'm trying to do is just keep us focused on finishing the finishing the job, and I don't think that the 15J, with the limited resources that we have, if we're gonna spend that time over 2020, I think that I'd rather finish the job on custom than uh, sort of relook at stock and compare stock and custom. I'd rather just be done with it. I just to clarify, the custom are cordless. So that move to cordless products is significant and certainly affects safety. I just, and my time is winding down here, but most importantly, I just think that we've made tremendous progress. 15J is yet another step in the right direction, and I'm just confused as to why, other than some ulterior motive that I expect uh, is what we're getting at here, is why we would disregard 15J, a concrete way to approach safety, another step in the right direction, and then um, just disregard that and pursue, pers you know, proceed in another direction. Commissioner Biacco. Uh, just a, uh, maybe a point of clarification. It's my understanding that the intent of this amendment is um, not to undo and that this does not undo what's already in place, correct? Correct. And uh, this is, uh, my understanding that you guys have been working on, or the commission has been working on window coverings al al along these lines for about 10 years, correct? Correct, and the longer still, put, correct. Okay, and, and it, it, am I correct that there's still a piece out there in uh, that the agency has already agreed to commence working on uh, cons uh, custom products? Uh, not only the agency agreed to do it, the industry originally agreed to do it and has recently declined to move forward at this time based on um, what has happened in Canada. But there was an agreement to address this and they would have already reopened it. Okay, and, and, and does, does your amendment, is it intended um, to move that portion forward? I mean, is, that's how I read the amendment. Yes, it is intended to move forward and address the unaddressed portions of this product category. I, I see no reason um, not to support it. I think we need to move forward with what has already been, what is still on the uh, agenda to get finished. And if that's what the intent of this amendment uh, would do, then I, I, I would support it. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Uh, I think listening to the conversation and the discussion here on the dais, it's important to give credit to the industry for the progress that it has made on a voluntary standard for stock product. Uh, but, but. Uh, at the same time, I am disappointed that the progress appears to have stalled with respect to custom product and the commitments that industry made uh, to agency staff in those discussions. Um, 
if we had a statutory basis to move forward with a mandatory safety standard for custom products, I think that's something that might be appropriate and something that I would support. Um, I, I appreciate what you're trying to do here via 15J. Um, I think that's uh, a, a preliminary step in a, in a, in a process. Um, oftentimes what we see in terms of moving forward with, with, with mandatory standards is that that sometimes is the sufficient pressure to apply to break through log jams in the voluntary standards discussion. Um, I'm not sure the amendment as you're proposing it right now applies pressure in that way and therefore would, would, support, uh, would, 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 would support that outcome. But I appreciate your attention to the issue and the leadership that you've demonstrated on window covering safety over the years and for offering the amendment. Thank you. Commissioner Kaye response. Thank you, Chairman Adler. I guess I want to reassure Commissioner Burkle that there is no ulterior motive. I think that the, I think I've been very clear in the entire time that I've been at the agency and worked on the issue that the goal is to address all the hazards and I just, I don't, I see 15J potentially after there's, a, if the voluntary standard ends up addressing custom as well as stock, then maybe at that point 15J would make sense from an enforcement standpoint. But at this point to me, based on where we are, it's just a judgment call that I would see the resources more appropriately used toward, as Commissioner Bayako did a great job stating, addressing the remaining portions as opposed to sort of locking in just the stock part. Thank you. Commissioner Burkle, additional comments or questions? I, I do have just a couple of additional comments. Um, number one, I just want to again emphasize that the Health Canada standard is purely theoretical at this point. We are so far ahead of what st our staff has done to get us beyond, so far beyond what Health Canada is proposing. Uh, I think they deserve a tremendous amount of credit for that work and for getting us. And now they want to move us yet further in, a, in the direction of safety with this 15J that I, 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 again, I'm confused. So holding Health Canada up to me is apples and oranges. That is not a standard that's in place and they have an election this year and who knows what will happen to that, uh, to that standard. And since when do we try to emulate other countries' standards? We have staff here who identified the issue and the best way forward was to segment and that's how we got to the stock and now we need to continue in the right direction. The other thing I want to just make sure I'm clear about uh, and perhaps have a conversation about this, you used the phrase recently declined with regards to customs. I don't, that is not what I heard in my WCMA meeting. They are trying to assess, they're trying to understand the implications if and when the Health Canada standard goes into effect, how that, whether or not it does affect safety, some of the provisions in that, uh, in that rule, what they're proposing, what it would, how it would impact their manufacturer, the price of the product. So um, I don't think I heard declined. I think it was a pause was the word I heard. And then we will begin opening this up again. But I guess my question to, to Commissioner Kay is, how does what you're proposing make consumers safe? more safe than a 15J rule would, would do? Well, it would identify the areas that staff believes have not been addressed in custom and it would provide a roadmap for industry when it is ready to resume, whether it's a decline or a pause, I'm, I can't speak for them. Clearly, Commissioner Feldman got some impression similar to mine that industry is not moving at the pace that it had been moving at and consistent with its um, commitments, but putting that aside, I think it's more important to develop a roadmap going forward for what remains unaddressed than to not have that roadmap. That gives us clarity, that gives, puts staff on the record, it can accelerate the process because staff can redline the voluntary standard and provide any proposed changes to the standard that would address the custom issues and the process can move that much faster. And so just a follow up, what would preclude us from enacting the 15J and still having staff, you know, create this roadmap that you're talking about to identify where we, what other hazards need to be addressed? Uh, that, I think staff would have to address that from a resource perspective. Well, I think staff put it in the ops plan. So I think it would be up to you to decide where you would offset if, if you were willing to do both. It would be 
Somebody's time has expired, and I'm not sure whose it is, so I don't know what it, to do. I think it's Commissioner Burkle, and I realize that uh, it's, it's my first uh, time back in the acting chairman. I'm being somewhat flexible about the use of time. If that bothers anybody, please let me know. But otherwise, I like the idea of trying to be fairly flexible about time. So if you want to respond, please. Sure, please thank do. you. Um, so I, I really am uncomfortable digging too far into how this ended up in the operating plan because I don't think that that is a wise thing to do, but I can say that I had discussions with technical staff and this was not their idea. So I don't want the public to be left with the impression that our safety experts got together in a room and they sat around the table and said, what is the most effective thing that we can do on window coverings? And this idea popped out and that's why it's in the operating plan. My understanding is that's not what happened. That's all I want to say on that part of it. But I do believe, based on staff's work, the technical staff's work in the past, the EXHR staff and the compliance staff that have attended these meetings and that have put in all the work, I do think that this finishing off the custom, having a roadmap, would be more effective to address the remaining work and more consistent with what staff's approach has been than the 15J. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bianco? Nothing, thank you. Commissioner Feldman? No further questions. Uh, I have no further questions. Any closing thoughts or comments? If not, then we will uh, turn to vote on Commissioner Kay's amendment. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Bianco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? No. And I vote yes. Uh, the yeses are three, the noes are two, the amendment passes. Uh, Commissioner Kay, do you have additional amendments? I do. I have an amendment on the ROV termination. May I proceed? Yes, please. Thank you, Chairman Adler. So my next amendment is consistent with the Q&A that I engaged in in the beginning with Mr. Ray, our Deputy Executive Director of Safety Operations, who is in the room. His name card is on the table, but he's not at the table. Uh, based on that conversation, my understanding is that he confirmed that when the commission passed in January of 2017, a retrospective analysis of the recreational off-highway vehicle voluntary standard that staff was given a direction to do four different parts of an assessment. I'm not going to read all four of them. They're, they're publicly available. And Mr. Ray confirmed that those four items will be considered in the staff termination package if the commission were to approve the op plan as, and with that package in it. So all my amendment does, and I know that there were different versions of this floating around, but I want to make clear that the version that I'm offering does not change the name of the project. All it does is codify those four areas. It makes it clear that staff will do what Mr. Ray said it will do. It doesn't change any resources. It doesn't change the scope of the project. It just makes the operating plan, if the amendment is adopted, more accurate and more transparent. Is there a second to the amendment? Second. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have a round of questions and comments. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Kay for introducing this amendment. I support it uh, in particular. Uh, his reference to the retrospective review of the voluntary standards is directed by the Commission in January 2017, as I recall. I was instrumental in drafting that amendment, so I'm hardly disposed to vote against that which I had proposed and was approved by the Commission. So I uh, commend Commissioner Kay for this amendment, and I fully plan to support it. Commissioner Burkle? Thank you. Uh, I should look at Commissioner Adler because he's our cinephile, but I think this is analogous to Groundhog Day. I cannot believe we still, two years later, are talking about our OV termination. That package came up, staff recommended to us, and again, the commission disregarded staff's advice uh, that we should terminate our OV rulemaking when it came to the lateral stability issue. And at that hearing, and it is true, um, we talked about um, a retrospective review. But that is not contingent upon the ROV termination. And although, and I know uh, Mr. Ray mentioned that the four parts will be in the package that comes up, I don't think they need to be. Um, I think that the ROV termination is two years past 
termination. We said to our staff and to industry, if you get to this point, we will terminate the rulemaking. And they operated in good faith, both parties did, our agency and industry. And they got to that point and we moved the goalpost. We then got into hang tags. And then we got into retrospective review. And we've got riders in every one of our appropriations bills about not working on this issue. This is absurd that we haven't terminated this rulemaking. It, it, it really goes to the credibility of the commission and how w when we talk to the stakeholders and we say we will do certain things if we get to this point and then we continue to move that goalpost, I think it is disingenuous and I think it is a problem for the agency. Um, we now are on to and we are developing standards and working with industry and all of the stakeholders with regards to debris penetration and the thermal issues and we are now have gone on to working on those standards to do a retrospective review. Um, I have no problem with that looking to see whether or not it's, it's but to tie that to terminating the rulemaking I think is, is incorrect. This should have been done two years ago and we failed to do it then and we shouldn't prolong this any further. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Biacco? I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear Commissioner uh, Burkle complain about how long this, the termination process is taking here. This summer, Commissioner uh, Biacco and I supported a poll to accelerate the termination process consistent with staff's recommendation that it be terminated, which she opposed at the time. I think it's important that we follow staff's guidance, move as quickly as possible to terminate this rule, which is why I would uh, oppose the amendment. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, Kay, further comments? Would you like to respond? Sorry. Commissioner Burkle. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you. Um, the only comment I have to Commissioner Feldman is the appropriate way to bring this package up was through the ops plan, which staff has done. Commissioner Kay. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to yield if anyone needs time. Okay. Um, I did want to make one uh, comment or two comments. Um, I don't recall personally ever promising that if the industry came up with the voluntary standard that I would automatically terminate and I don't feel I've moved the goalposts. There may have been an implicit notion in the air, but I I'd also want to remind all of us that uh, as far as I'm concerned, when the industry uh, didn't like the NPR that the staff had co come up with, they went and ran screaming to the hill and got an appropriations rider that stalled any further work that the commission was undertaking. So I find it hard to attribute a lot of good faith to the industry, at least in that respect. So I think this is an appropriate uh, amendment that uh, Commissioner Kay has put forward, and again, I strongly support it. Additional comments or questions? If not, we will move to a vote on Commissioner Kay's Second Amendment. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Biacco? No. Commissioner Feldman? No. And I vote yes. Uh, the no's are three. The uh, amendment is defeated. Commissioner Kay, do you have additional amendments? I do, thank you. May I proceed on my crib bumper? Yes, please do. Thank you. My next amendment also goes to uh, transparency in the operating plan and this has to do with the crib bumper package which right now as staff proposed it is would be a final rule in the current fiscal year 2020 um, recently the Commission has signals an intent to have a hearing I believe that hearing will be in late January of 2020 if that has not been publicly that, that you know, is correct um, now I'm publicly making that available thank you for that um, I think that that will likely have a material impact on the timing of the work that could happen afterward because I'm guessing that there will be a comment period associated with that remaining open after the hearing. Usually we do that. And so just based on normal timing of how long it takes us to do work and the fact that this particular package um, has areas that at least some of us on the dais might believe uh, need more technical work, I am not sure it's realistic that this will be a final rule. So the only point of this amendment is to just try to be more accurate in the operating plan and move it to a DATR, which stands for data analysis and technical review, which I think is a more accurate reflection of the work that will occur in 2020. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you. Uh, now we will begin a round of questions and comments. I don't have much of a uh, question or comment, simply to say that I strongly approve of Commissioner Kay's amendment. I just want to make sure that our stakeholders are not misreading the move from putting it as an FR and replacing that with DATR. I think you've more than adequately explained why we're doing that. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I have looked at the staff package for an NPR, and I, before we uh, begin to address that, I think there are serious questions about the uh, analytics that are contained in that, and this is one of those where I think uh, in the interest of transparency and openness, the Commission ought to hear from stakeholders and from public health experts who may have strong disagreements with what's contained in the staff briefing package. So I strongly, strongly support this amendment. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple of questions for Commissioner Kay about what is the purpose of this and where does this get us, but I think he explained that in his introduction, so I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Biacco? Um, j just a, uh, a comment. Um, in light of the hearing, I think that um, I, I would not support this in the same way um, that uh, it was different in a, in a different amendment. I, I, I look forward to the hearing and I want to be able to proceed with a final rule. Um, if and when that hearing uh, yields that direction. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman, any comments? I have no objections to this amendment and no, no questions. Thank you. Uh, other questions or comments on this? If not, we, I'll call the vote. Um, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Biacco, how do you vote? No. Commissioner... Thank God I've got people here helping me get through this. Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? I vote yes. Uh, and Commissioner Feldman? I vote yes. And I vote yes, and I wasn't recording that, but if I understand, it was a four to one. Okay, and so the amendment passes. Commissioner Kay, do you have additional amendments? I do, thank you. We're getting there. Um, my next amendment has to do with ATV action plans. Uh, the commission has different authorities to enforce safety associated with all-terrain vehicles, one of them uh, based on the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, codifying a settlement on a lawsuit has to do with so-called ATV action plans, which in essence means that firms cannot import or sell ATVs in the absence of the commission approving an ATV action plan. Uh, this has become, I have a prior statement on this issue and a lot of concerns with it. Uh, this has become a rote exercise, in my opinion, at the agency and has become unmoored from its original safety purpose. But putting aside those concerns, I think my larger concern is we've been presented with enough evidence that, in my opinion, we are not actually enforcing our ATV action plans. And so I think that they are not only uh, ineffective on their face, but they're probably toothless. And I'm concerned about that, and I'm not going to get into the specific um, instances that have been referred to us of non-compliance with ATV action plans, specifically with children's ATVs, which I think are, should be the most disconcerting with all of us. I will say, though, that I think we've been presented with enough evidence to have significant concerns about the, um, about whether or not parties are living up to their end of the deal with these ATV action plans. And so all my amendment would do would, uh, have staff brief the commission in a closed setting on the status of enforcement and compliance with ATV action plans. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Um, I again thank Commissioner Kay for uh, this amendment. Uh, I like the fact that he has changed uh, the requirement for report to a briefing, which I think is perfectly appropriate, and I appreciate that. Um, and so I fully plan to support it. Commissioner Burkle, any questions or comments? I have no questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Biacco? Just a short one. Um, Commissioner Kidd, this, this um, amendment doesn't um, add any additional requirements to, to uh, what the staff is already doing or required to do. It, it just asks for a briefing, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman? I think more transparency from staff is always a good thing, and therefore I'm inclined to support this. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Not after that, definitely not. Okay, well, let, let's see if I get the vote count right this time. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. 
And I vote yes. That's easy. It was unanimous, uh, and the amendment is approved. Commissioner Kaye, do you have additional amendments? I do. I have one more. Thank you. And this has to do with residential elevators. Um, I think the commission, again, I have a statement on this as well. I think the commission has pre been presented with more than enough information about the hazards associated with these products. And I believe that the operating plan should include um, a reflection of our work to address these hazards. And so my amendment would only, in my understanding, reflect existing work and include a reference to residential elevators amongst the projects that we are working on. Uh, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I strongly support this. I do think residential elevators are a point of serious concern. I'm glad to see that the Commission is undertaking steps to investigate uh, and to address the issues related to residential elevators, so I strongly support this. Commissioner uh, Burkle, any questions or comments? Just a comment. Um, I will support this amendment. I think it's uh, just identifying a hazard in, in the uh, ops plan is, is a good thing, but I do think it's important to recognize this is not a new issue. This has been around for a very long time. The agency has heard about this issue. We've talked with uh, many of the manufacturers uh, over the years. Uh, this is not something that just is rearing its ugly head. It's been around, and I think the agency, it's good that we're identifying it in our um, hazards and listing it as a mechanical hazard, but it is not anything new that we haven't dealt with before. Thank you. Commissioner Bianco? No questions. Commissioner Feldman? No questions. Uh, any additional questions or comments? If not, then I will call the vote. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Bianco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, uh, the amendment is passed. And now I want to ask my colleagues for some advice. Uh, we've, I believe, reached the end of Commissioner Kay's amendments, and we are about to embark on uh, Commissioner Biaco's amendments, am I correct on that? I think you have somewhere between 10 or 12. I was wondering if folks would uh, want to take a break for lunch and then come back after that. Okay. Uh, why don't we take 45 minutes for lunch? Uh, so that means we will be back at, uh, somebody do the math, but 12.30, right. Thank you. So the commission is adjourned until 12.30.
Thank you. Welcome back to a continuation of the meeting of the Commission's deliberation regarding the 2020 uh, operating plan. We now move to uh, further amendments, but before we do that, I want to welcome back uh, John McGugan, who is our AV specialist for uh, one day. He's pinch hitting for Rock Grant, who is, sadly is home ill, but we love having John back and we uh, are thrilled to have him here. Okay. Uh, at this point, I will uh, turn to Commissioner Biacco and ask you if you have amendments. I do. Thank you. My first amendment um, seeks to, on page two of the um, operating plan uh, at the budget table, to delete footnote two. Uh, and the footnote reads, includes one FTE for a consumer ombuds position. Um, I move to strike this um, this footnote for several reasons. First, the op plan does contemplate the approval of an additional full-time equivalent in the office of the executive director. And I do not object to um, adding any FTE to the office of the uh, executive director generally, but the, it's the accompanying footnote to this um, proposed FTE that raises, for me, multiple procedural and substantive issues that I cannot ignore and I cannot uh, ratify. It is my understanding that this footnote is intended to signify that if the op plan is adopted, the agency will create, hire, and empower an FTE to serve as a consumer ombudsman, a new position at the CPSE, and that consumer ombudsman will be housed in the office of the executive director. <clears throat> Nowhere in the op plan, however, is there any further explanation of this position. There is no written job description, no qualifications required of the candidate, no policy basis, and no enabling authority for the creation of this new position. And there has been no notice to the public of what this position involves. Now, I, I addressed these issues at the briefing uh, of, uh, on this op plan on September 24th, and I believe that at that time, uh, acting, uh, acting Chair Adler referred me to a packet of information that he circulated in May that described his vision for the position of a consumer ombudsman. That packet contained a cover memo entitled Proposal to Create a Consumer Ombudsman at the CPSC in six attachments, some of which were still in draft form, including a draft motion to add a consumer ombudsman, which has not to this day been presented, and a draft mission statement for the consumer ombudsman position, um, and other attachments, which I believe Commissioner Adler intended to be support for his proposal. Now, none of the contents of the packet have been deliberated by the Commission, and I can say that while I might not object in concept, I do object to many of the points contained in the packet. In fact, I have not been given a chance to provide input regarding this consumer ombudsman position. Today, it is my understanding that no motion will be presented and the contents of that packet will not be deliber deliberated or even disclosed. Rather, the intent is that if the op plan as a whole is adopted, then this new agency position as described in this packet would be approved as part of the op plan. I do not agree that can be done. A position such as this must be created pursuant to the procedures set forth in the Administrative Procedure Act. The Commission may not skip over critical and fundamental steps required to issue an agency rule, which is exactly what is required here to create, hire, and empower a consumer ombudsman who will presumably carry out new policy as described in Acting Chair Adler's draft packet. Rather, the Commission must set forth explicitly the policies to be advanced by this position and provide a description of the position um, which needs to be then codified. And the consumer ombudsman position is to be, in, and because it's in, uh, intended to be included within the office of the executive director, there is a regulation that governs that office, which is 16 CFR 1000.18, and that will need to be properly amended because as it is currently written, it does not contemplate in any way, shape, or form a consumer ombudsman, <clears throat> and certainly not one as described in this packet. Finally, obje I object to the creation of any new agency position without proper notice to the public. 
The op plan contains nothing to provide the public with an understanding of what the agency plans to implement vis-a-vis -vis the newly designed position. This is contrary to our most fundamental policy to involve the public in activities to the fullest extent possible to ensure public conf confidence in the integrity of commission decision making. And I'll refer the commission to 16 CFR section 1011.1 A through C, which provides the commission's, <clears throat> and I'll quote, general provisions concerning public notice for various types of agency activities necessary to carry out its mandate. To the extent that the ombudsman position referenced in this footnote is based on a packet of information circulated in draft form by a single commissioner at another time and for another purpose, and which is not tied to or incorporated in any way into the op plan, it is just not proper, and therefore I must move to strike footnote two on page two of the op plan. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Thank you. Uh, and we will now uh, have questions and comments, and um, I will begin. Uh, so, if I'm understanding correctly, Commissioner Biacco, your main objection is procedural and not necessarily substantive with respect to the position? I would say procedural, but uh, if we're going to be referring to the packet, I, I don't agree with all the contents of the packet substantively. And could you give me an example of some of the objections you have to the description of the uh, consumer ombudsman? I can. One that uh, jumps out into my mind right away is that the consumer ombudsman, um, uh, the, proposed, the proposal is that the consumer ombudsman would serve as a liaison between families or as it's described, victims of, who have suffered death or injury from a uh, defective product. I do not believe that uh, that is the agency's role at all, and I don't believe that the um, enabling statute contemplated that we would be getting involved <clears throat> or have anybody that's qualified <clears throat> excuse me to deal with with families in that nature there is nothing that the consumer product safety commission can do with regard to um, you know, victims and their families. Uh, another uh, example is um, uh, that uh, it was proposed that the ombudsman would link families together who have suffered um, uh, different uh, injuries and harms related to a consumer product. I think that that is designed to um, uh, create a basis um, for uh, with, for um, I, I just don't think that that is, is appropriate under these circumstances. I also think it, it violates, uh, we're going to have a run into 6B problems. Um, I, I don't think uh, the way this was proposed, it was proposed to be a sister pro program to the agency's small business ombudsman. Um, and I think there was an attempt to draw similar uh, concepts, but they're not similar at all. The small business ombudsman was um, put in place pursuant to um, actually uh, an act and several things that the uh, Consumer Product Safety uh, commission was doing at the time to promote uh, I I the small business policies. We don't have um, uh, policies like promoting uh, re uh, relationships between consumers and the interworkings, I believe is, is the phrase, the agency. We also don't have a reason to have consumers, um, to have somebody, in, and generally an ombudsman works out resolutions, and we don't have situations where staff and consumers need need to have uh, somebody interface with them to come up with resolutions. I do believe that as commissioners, we act in, in uh, some ways as a consumer ombudsman. And indeed, um, I, I have experienced this, I know we all have, where we've in, w worked with parents who have problems and, and facilitating their issues. I, I just don't see um, many of the things that are listed in the packet as appropriate for this position. But again, I think that's the point. We haven't discussed this at all, and maybe we could come up with something, but it's not the same as the consumer um, uh, or the small business ombudsman. We would be putting in place a, an ombudsman that favors one group of our stakeholders to the exclusion of all the others, and I don't think that that's um, just. Okay, reclaiming my time, uh, may I say that uh, I understand uh, many of your objections, uh, and I do want to add a couple of points. First of all, uh, there are no, no 
legal requirements of the sort that you are addressing. There is nothing in the Administrative Procedure Act and nothing in the Consumer Product Safety Act or its regulations that would any way bar us from adding uh, as part of the operating plan this new position. Uh, and I'm fully prepared to support uh, Commissioner Feldman's uh, recommendations for adding FTEs for a technologist and an analytics officer. Um, with respect to input on this, this is, uh, I'm delighted to say, uh, the description that I have uh, in for the consumer ombudsman is something that I would be delighted and eager to sit down and discuss with all of my colleagues and get as much input as I could. And certainly, uh, we have reached out to many outside organizations to get their input in crafting uh, this uh, proposal. And I do disagree f strongly that there, this is not analogous to the Small Business Ombudsman. I think it's exactly analogous. We have some really un strong unmet needs at the agency. When people file complaints in the database, the vast majority of those never get posted because consumers come in with deficient uh, reports of harm. A consumer ombudsman can help people fill out those reports of harm. Uh, we have an office that need, we need an office that can explain our rules and regulations to consumers in the way that the small business ombudsman does for companies. Uh, people call us and they ask for details on agency recalls. This is a great repository for staff to be able to explain to consumers what their rights and uh, duties are with respect to recalls. Um, we don't get very many petitions from consumers. We get some from consumer groups, but one of the things that we set when we first began the agency was the whole idea of asking members of the public to file petitions with us, and this would be a perfect office to help consumers do that. And finally, and I think terribly important, one of the great deficiencies in the voluntary standards process that I see is we simply don't get enough consumer participants, and this would be an office that would reach out uh, in addition to working with our voluntary standards uh, coordinator to try to recruit consumers to join in voluntary standards proceedings. So I strongly, strongly support uh, retaining this, and I strongly disagree. Uh, with Commissioner Biacco. Uh, my, my time is up. I turn to Commissioner Burkle. Thank you very much. I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, my first question is would, and actually it's probably more to Acting Chair Adler. Fire away. <laughs> just in terms of this justification memo, I'll call it, that's not the PD for the position. That was just sort of encapsulating a concept rather than the a specifics. Absolutely correct. And uh, the PD would be a separate document. Absolutely and correct. And that would be something I would, look at. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, and that would be something I would uh, go out of my way to consult with my colleagues to help craft a, a very good position description as uh, we've heard it described. It's aspirational. It's, it's the view that uh, we have regarding the need for this, but there may be some concrete things that we put in that we shouldn't have and some things that we didn't put in that we should. So thank you for that question. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do want to say I strongly support the position. And I, it was interesting listening, Commissioner Bayako, to one of the areas that you were talking about with regard to the justification for the position and I think actually one of the most compelling reasons that had been presented to me was this idea that we do already have people who interact with victims, whoever they are, when there's a consumer product associated hazard. And we've certainly heard feedback from some families that those are very challenging interactions despite the best intentions of our investigators who are trained on how to conduct those interactions. And if there's some way to make that um, necessary communication, and it is a necessary communication, if we're gonna do an in-depth investigation, we have to contact the victims and have access to information. If we are gonna do that, I do think that if we have somebody who's a specialist in that skill set, uh, I do think that that could help harmonize how we engage with victims and uh, hopefully lead to easy, it won't be easy, but an easier emotional 
uh, situation in those understandably difficult circumstances. I do agree with you, though, that from a process standpoint, this is not ideal. And to demonstrate the awkwardness, I actually have to ask a question not of you as the sponsor of the amendment, but as uh, Commissioner Burkle did of, of Acting Chair Adler, if that's okay, because we this has not been put in front of us to actually discuss on the merits. We're sort of backdooring it through your amendment. So I appreciate that process concern. The uh, I would just ask of Acting Chair Adler, the, the hesitation, and I've articulated this to him before, the hesitation that I've had, and it's a small one with this position, is that it's human nature that if somebody understands that somebody else has a specific job responsibility, that they might pay attention to that issue less. That basically their view is that's getting covered by somebody else. And so how can you reassure me that the agency generally is not just going to assume that consumer issues are all this one person's responsibility and nobody else on staff. We are the Consumer Product Safety Commission, so presumably everybody on staff is supposed to be considering consumer issues. I just need some assurance that this won't uh, just unintentionally lead people to assume somebody else is covering the consumer angle and they don't have to be thinking about that. I think we, that's a great question and I think we have a terrific role model in terms of the SBO. The SBO works intimately, closely with other offices within the agency. I think people, our stakeholders, definitely understand that they, a good starting point might be the small business ombudsman, but the small business ombudsman serves as a liaison within the agency. But um, it does seem to me that a starting point would be for people to contact the consumer ombudsman, and if the consumer ombudsman is as effective as the small business ombudsman, uh, the agency at large will understand those concerns, and there will be tremendous coordination uh, among the offices, in particular between the Office of Small Business Ombudsman and the Office of Consumer Ombudsman. Okay, thank you for that answer. And uh, to uh, Commissioner Bayako's point, I do wonder if there's some way to have some type of um, procedure in place where we can have a greater sense of how this will roll out. I'm not necessarily in agreement with her that all these things are required, but to your earlier point in terms of the rollout and the understanding of, of how this position fits in and what the responsibilities are, I hope that we can have uh, more of an agreement on, on what the role of the commission may or may not be and what our understanding of how this will happen. That's a fair comment, and I certainly would be open to any suggestions and any improvements in the process, and I thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. And uh, Acting Chairman Adler, I just want to take a moment to thank you for your leadership on the matter. I know that this is something that you've been discussing for some time, uh, and if, in fact, uh, the, the position carries in, in the underlying uh, operations plan, I, I hope and this is a view that, that I'm, I'm hearing expressed across the, the dais that we'll have an opportunity to work with you to shape it in the appropriate way. Um, I'm less concerned about some of the procedural concerns that have been raised, uh, but do have a couple questions for Commissioner Biacco um, about whether she thinks that this role, as it's been described, is redundant of other CPSC positions or agency functions? Yes, I do, actually, and uh, let me address a couple of them. Uh, I think Commissioner Kay uh, raised one that has been on my mind, and that is you know, uh, the investigation team. I mean, I've, all, I, I've been pressing our investigators in the field to, you know, particularly when there is a, a death or a serious injury, that we get the product so that we can actually look at that. And we do have some um, uh, people who handle that and interact with the families in, in that regard. So that's, I think, already in that department. If we wanted to expand that, that's a different scenario. I also think that um, we have a... Uh, uh, to the extent that you know we all interact with the consumers and we all have an opportunity to uh, not just the commissioners but the staff to interact with questions i thought it was interesting <clears throat> that commissioner adler raised concerns about um you know uh, consumers not being able to fill out forms or whatnot well I have to be honest, let's fix the website and make it user friendly. Let's not put in a brand new position designed to help a consumer fill out a report. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a, that's a necessary justification. So if your view is that the position is um, redundant in those respects, do you also believe that creating this position would be in any way contradictory to 
any of our statutory obligations, including that we be neutral or that we enforce our laws without favor to one side or the other? Well, I do, and uh, thank you for raising that because I do think, I mean, I, one of you, I can't remember who said this, but they used the word, we need to recruit more people to participate in voluntary. So we have no business recruiting um, and uh, uh, facilitating one side against the other. I, I don't think that's the proper uh, use. And, and that, that, I guess, begs the question. We have a footnote in an op plan that is designed um, to adopt this program that we are all disagreeing in different ways. And it is not enough for me to say, we'll work with you later because I don't know what I'm voting on. And I'm not willing to vote on something in the dark. Um, I don't know how Commissioner Adler can assure anyone that um, there, you know, there won't be some uh, some issue, as Commissioner Kay raised, that uh, nobody will think that working with consumers is their responsibility anymore because we have an ombudsman. I don't know how we can assure um, anyone of that. We, have, we don't even have a PD. I, I, I also think that um, we have some problems with regard to our regulations and how this um, is designed to be put in. Okay. I appreciate that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Do you have additional comments? I do. I, I want to respond to, to um, a couple things. You know, I think it's interesting that um, you've relied on the agency's small business ombudsman program to support the creation of this one. Um, in fact, I know that you know, there are some, and I know you believe that there are multiple similarities between the consumer ombudsman and the small business ombudsman, but what's, it, it, what's interesting to me is this footnote approach and what we're dealing with here ignores the very process by which the uh, small business ombudsman was created. It's a process that should have been applied here. The small business ombudsman Budsman was created through a final rule and pursuant to the procedures set forth in the Administrative uh, Procedure Act. The Commission's small business policies and a description of the small business ombudsman, they're codified at 16 CFR 1020. Um, we uh, went through a series of analysis with that, and none of that was done here. All we have before the Commission right now is an op plan with a consumer ombudsman reference in a footnote and a detached draft packet describing a single Commissioner's concept. That does not, in my opinion, satisfy the Administrative Procedure Act or, or, or constitute an appropriate way to create such a program, especially one that we all have views on. Um, I also think that uh, we have an, you have another uh, procedural problem that I don't think you can get past, and that is, you know, th if this is going to be housed in the way it's presented in the op plan in the office of the executive director, that regulation that governs that office must be amended. You cannot backdoor amend something by sticking in a footnote. And I think if we start doing that, we are going down a slippery slope of, you know, uh, ignoring the procedures that are so important to this agency. If I might respond, um, uh, several points. Again, uh, I think the concern that Commissioner Kay raised about can we make this a, a, a fuller process, I'm, I'm, per, I'm sympathetic to the notion that there's any violation of the Administrative Procedure Act or of any statutory requirements or any rules or regulations that the Commission has, is, to me, is just flat, flat out wrong. Uh, we add positions all the time to the agency and we don't go through this elaborate process that you've uh, you've described. Uh, and I would love to say let's fix the problems of filing uh, reports of harm by changing our website, but that's not the problem. The problem is the statutory requirements for filing reports of harm are very extensive and that's where consumers stumble So, and that's where they need help. Uh, I would also object to your notion that uh, we can only deal with things in a neutral fashion. When we're recruiting consumers to participate in the process, we're not telling them what positions to take. We're just saying you're an incredible stakeholder and interest group that needs to be involved in the same way that we go out and we try to recruit small businesses to participate. As far as I know, nobody's telling them what position to take. We're just telling them that it's important that they join uh, with the agency. And I would also point out once again that uh, I will point out that uh, our own regulations, which set forth requirements for participating in voluntary standards proceedings, require us to guarantee or to ensure that consumer voices are heard. That's exactly what this office should be doing, and I see nothing improper about that whatsoever. 
I think the entire thing that the agency does, we are the Consumer uh, Product Safety um, Commission. We, we are charged with protecting the consumer. We start with the premise that this agency represents consumers and the interests of consumers and uh, uh, promotes their interest. Recruiting, and I, 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 I don't think you can assure me what is being done if we're recruiting a particular person or business to participate in a particular standard. The other question I have for you, uh, uh, Acting Chair Adler, is can you give me an example of a position we created here without going through the proper rules? Uh, I can't give you one because we've always gone through the proper exactly. rules. What I'm saying is, and we've done it, and this is doing it in precisely the same manner as we've added other positions. Um, and we're about to add some additional positions uh, that uh, Commissioner Feldman has recommended to Let, us. Let's stay with this one because well, I think I, this I, one is a little bit uh, different than uh, those. And I guess I don't, but the fact is uh, there's a difference between a legal requirement, uh, which does not exist in terms of adding a position like this, and a good practice and procedure. And uh, to the extent that we uh, should take steps to consult with our colleagues, uh, I think that's a great suggestion, and I think, I, and I certainly would follow up on that. In terms of consulting with outside uh, interest groups, we have done that extensively, I can assure you. So if we've always followed the process um, and, the, and the procedure, um, why aren't we doing it here? I think uh, there is a requirement. There absolutely is a requirement. Well, we disagree on that, and since that's a legal issue, we can sit down and debate it our, ourselves. But uh, I, let me suggest that we move on uh, to additional comments. Uh, Commissioner Burkle. Um, I do concur with some of Commissioner Biacco's concerns, and I think they're legitimate ones. But I, I think that there, when we put a placeholder, a foothold, or a footnote into the ops plan, it really is just the starting point for the discussion. It only acknowledges, and if the ops plan is voted on and approved, then we begin from there. We don't begin from a memo, an underlying justification memo, or anywhere else. It is, uh, it is then gives the, the staff, along with the commission, the um, authority to now move forward and to fill this position. So. I think there's a lot of room, and later on in some of the amendments that we're going to be talking about, um, again, the staff has a, 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 I won't say a tremendous amount, but a certain amount of authority to proceed, but certainly with the input from the commissioners. And I think that this is just the starting point, and the office could be crafted however the commissioners uh, in working with staff feel it could be to, to really provide the best benefit that it could. So I just think this is the starting point. Nothing else beyond that has been decided. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to restate my strong support for the position and the creation of it and the value I see in it. Uh, I do want to follow up on something Commissioner Perkle said, which I agree with, and uh, I want to expand upon. And this goes to seeking additional clarification from your much appreciated commitment to have a fuller process. I would like to see as part of that process some specific uh, opportunity for staff to weigh in with staff's views of how this would all work because I feel like maybe it's assumed in here that that would happen, but I didn't see anything explicit of how this would roll out that we would be the beneficiaries of staff's thoughts on how to make this work. So I would seek clarification on that point. Uh, may I, adopting the majesty of this office, <laughs> give you my personal assurance that I will do so and that we will uh, consult extensively with staff. And in fact, this is really part of what's happened with the other positions that have been added. We clearly turn to the office of the executive director and all of uh, the office's uh, rep uh, direct reports to get good feedback, and I promise that I will do that, and I also promise that I will consult with each and every commissioner who's interested in discussing it fully before Great. we move uh, and to And just it. to fill that triangle out from you to staff and from you to us, I would just ask that we have access to staff too and their thinking. In uh, that. Ab absolutely, you, you have my guarantee Great. on that. Thank you, well. and then just to, while I appreciate the invocation of the SBO as a justification for why I should not be concerned that everybody will not sort of assume somebody else is covering the consumer issues. We've been blessed with two fantastic small business ombuds people. We, we just have. They've been, they both have hit the ball out of the park. 
in that role. But I do believe, from my experience at least, there have at least anecdotally been times where an issue has come up where somebody will say, that's a small business issue. The SBO is taking care of that. That's the curse of them being so good at it is people assume they're taking care of it, and they usually are. And I think the where I would be a little concerned in your answer is you said that it would, if the issue got raised with the SB with the small uh, with the sorry with the consumer ombudsman, they would then of course coordinate with the rest of the staff. I think my concern is I wouldn't want the rest of the staff to have to wait until an issue is raised with the consumer ombudsman. That goes to the heart of my concern, which is that staff is still charged with affirmatively addressing, as Commissioner Bayako noted, consumer issues at the front of their minds. And so I would ask that, in however this rolls out, that there continue to be uh, a reminder that just because we are creating this position, if this op plan is approved with it, that that doesn't in any way shift responsibility or mission charges to the rest of the staff. Um, first of all, thank you for that comment. And I take that as a reminder for us, both in our dealings with the small business ombudsman and with the consumer ombudsman, to make clear to staff uh, that the, your concerns are legitimate and that just because something may fit within one office's jurisdiction, that doesn't mean they're precluded from taking action or being involved. I think it's a great reminder. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman. I have no additional questions. Thank Commissioner you. Commissioner Biacco. I do. I think this whole discussion um, demonstrates one of my points. Um, it's a footnote. We have a footnote with a title. Um, the way this is done violates the act. Uh, we have no description. We're up here debating this, and your promise um, that you'll consult with us um, is not sufficient to provide me with enough information to vote on this, uh, whether I want to agree to it or not, and who exactly has the final say here. I mean, you're going to consult with us on your idea, and then if you don't agree with us, you're going to do it anyway. That's not acceptable to me, which is why there are procedures in in place that need to be followed. A footnote in an op plan that basic that merely refers to an idea cannot be converted into a new substantive agency position that is going a uh, position that requires policy decisions and policy implementation um, by merely adopting the op plan in which the footnote is placed. It's a it's a pure violation of the um, APA. Well, we fundamentally disagree with that. Commissioner uh, Feldman, do you have it? Oh, I'm sorry. I asked additional comments from anybody on the uh, dais? If not, then we will move to a vote. Um, and so, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? No. Uh, Commissioner Biacco, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote uh, no. So one, two, three. The noes have it. The two, two yeses. Is that correct? Okay. The motion is not agreed to. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Biacco. Number two. This one's so much easier. Um, <laughs> on page nine in the mandatory standard summary table, I'm just asking that the um, line for the helmet petition be stricken because on September 17th, the petitioner withdrew the helmet petition. So this amendment is simply to align the operating plan to reflect that withdrawal. Um, uh, thank you for that explanation. Is there a second to the second. amendment? Okay. Um, and so we'll have discussion of this, and I only really had one question about this. Um, and that is, removing that uh, is an administrative acknowledgement that the petition has been withdrawn. It is not your suggestion that we must stop all work on the safety of helmets like this. Oh, I of gather. course not. Okay. Uh, with that, I have no further questions or comments. Commissioner Burkle? Uh, no question, just to thank you for picking up on this. And I see this is a technical amendment and for cleaning this up. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Uh, I support the amendment and any opportunities as reflected by my earlier amendments to make the op plan more accurate. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. No questions. I think this is helpful. Okay. Additional questions or comments? If not, then uh, we will move to a vote. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. That's a 5-0 uh, in favor. Commissioner uh, Biacco, your next amendment. Okay. On page 14, under um, uh, the heading Emerging Hazards with the code 13327, 
I would move to strike the sentence that says the CPSC will begin exploratory efforts related to the use of artificial intelligence slash machine learning in consumer products, end quote, and replace that with the following language. CPSC staff will collaborate with external partners and SDOs to begin exploratory efforts related to the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in consumer products and identify areas where this technology is applicable to CPSC's mission and commence work in those areas. Um, we, uh, the, the language is intended to expand on the um, a, a shorter sentence that is already in the op plan. I mean, this agency often talks about modernization and the need for the agency to understand and apply technology. And of course, just last year, we hosted a hearing on the Internet of Things, um, and I've met with many external stakeholders to discuss how AI and machine learning could help us meet some of our, our missions, um, and I'm pleased that we're considering it. I just think that we ought to be moving this forward and perhaps you know some uh, outside consultants or that we need to go further than just having a few hearings and then it, it dies on the vine so I, I would propose this language to accomplish that is there a second, second. thank you uh, we'll now move to questions and comments um, I mildly oppose this amendment uh, I certainly support the idea of exploring artificial intelligence uh, but my concerns are, first of all, I'm not quite sure what the resource implications of this are. And also, to me, it jumps a step that I'm not prepared to make at this point because uh, it moves from staff exploring the uh, use of uh, artificial intelligence to requiring us to collaborate with external partners before the staff has completed its exploration efforts as I say I mildly oppose it it's not a it's not a bad idea it just at this time uh, it's in terms of timing it, it causes me concerns uh, Commissioner Burkle thank you um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions and I guess what I'm trying to understand because we currently are doing some AI we um, staff in epi and other uh, s portions of the agency are looking at epi we uh, have talked about excuse me, have looked at uh, artificial intelligence, how can we help develop patterns, uh, whether it's with our SAS or, um, you know, we've had meetings with some of the outside um, groups to talk about technology. So I'm trying to understand what, what is this specifically getting at and does that play into what the agency is already doing on this front? And so maybe if you could explain. I'm somebody. trying to get us to move beyond what we're already doing on this front. And let me give you an example. Uh, just a few days ago on Twitter, um, there was a, a someone who advertised, hey, look, check this out, look what we did. And it was a CPSC data that they went onto our site, scraped, and then processed to show um, you know, different hazards in, of different products. It's fascinating. Don't know if it's correct. Don't know if, you know, uh, what the flaws are in that. But we should be doing exactly that. And if there are companies who are throwing this out there and, and able to do something like this that easily, we should be exploring this. And if we're not exploring this, we're just sitting and circulating the same information. I think this is designed to move forward and to start seeing what else is out there. I mean, if the, if, if the NFL can tell us on a commercial what the next play is likely to be, we should be able to have technology that tells us what the next or most risky uh, product hazard is. And I guess I would just go back to what I, I think we're doing this already. We've started doing this, and I, I, I guess I'm understanding you want to fast track this. Yes, of course. And so, but we don't know in terms of resource implications, whether staff or money, what that would take. I think we already um, have that money from the mid-year. I, we, we, are, we already have funding. I, I, it's how the funding and what we're doing. I, exploratory efforts in 2019, um, uh, we should be doing more than just exploring this within our own departments. The, the mid-year, to the best of my understanding, at least I haven't, now that I'm not, I haven't talked with Jay in the last couple of weeks, but I would assume at the end of the fiscal year, all the money from the mid-year has been let uh, it had to be because we can't we can't roll over our mo funds from year to year, and so I would guess the contracts and what we agreed to at mid year have already been that money has been allocated you based know, on the vote. One of the things that comes to mind as we're we're just chatting here is, 
you know, I would be interested to know, and I'm hoping, and if they haven't, then I'm hoping that this amendment would accomplish this, that our teams who are looking at this have reached out and at least explored with vendors, I know I have, uh, with vendors, what it would take, what it would cost, and what options are out there um, to us. And I haven't seen any of that, so I'm hoping that we would get there instead of just um, exploring whatever that means. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to let Commissioner Bianca know I 100% support the concept here. Totally on board. Um, it I just might need a little more information. So do you have a deliverable in mind? Of, so does the op plan, do you anticipate that by the end of the fiscal year, if this is adopted, that staff, what do you envision staff will have accomplished? And the reason I ask it that way, I know you're ready to answer, and I'm sorry. The That's reason okay. I ask it that way is only to, if the amendment were to pass, make it easier for staff so they understood what their goal is, what their objective is. Well, right now, their goal is to begin exploratory efforts related to the use. There's no deliverable in that. So I, I don't know if it's any different. I was just expanding that, but I would accept a, certainly a friendly amendment to put in here and deliver a report or anything that you would suggest. Well, this, so I appreciate that. And the second part of it is the resource implications. If, if I were assured that this would not have a material impact on the resources, I'd be right there with you. And I don't know how to get that assurance. I think that whatever we had proposed originally in the op plan, those resources would apply to this. And we're eventually going to get to a point where the resources run out and we're going to have to address it at that time. But until then, I'm just trying to expand what is already in the op plan. Would you be willing to have the language then reflect consistent with the dedicated resources in the staff op plan, meaning this would not have resource implications? I would. If there's a chance to amend it along those lines, I would. and then we could revisit this maybe at mid-year, yeah. I would be interested in, because if we could have this not change the resources, that makes it a lot easier to support. It wasn't intended, but I'd be happy to include something like so that. So I would move to amend the Bayaco Amendment to reflect that the Biaco Amendment be resource neutral relative to this provision of the operating plan. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. Okay, uh, further discussion? I assume we've heard the full discussion about that. Um, and are there any additional comments uh, one way or the other with respect to this? Commissioner Feldman, Commissioner Biaco? Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. We're, we are going to vote, uh, as I understand it, we're going to vote on the amended yeah. amendment, yeah. Okay, and, and then I'd be all, given an opportunity to offer my thoughts and questions on the underlying amendment? Uh, the, yes, uh, I think now is the appropriate time. Okay, well, I, I, I think it's important that CPSC conduct this type of work now so that we're not caught flat-footed if and when emerging technologies become emerging hazards. Um, I'm not sure that they will, but I believe that there's the potential that they might, may, and therefore I'm fully supportive of the amendment as drafted um, to the extent that we're contemplating making this resource neutral. Um, I, my preference would be to make this, uh, uh, the, the, the resource impact uh, be along the lines of that it not negatively impact our overall safety mission um, rather than to put this in such a way that it, it, it sort of further constrained in terms of resources. but. Uh, if there's consensus to uh, 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 accept that kind of language by the amendment sponsor, um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to that as well. I don't know what that means. Um, won't negatively impact our safety mission. Uh, I, that's just broad. I, that that's, to me is assume that we would not negatively impact our safety mission. I assume that it wouldn't, and therefore it would it would open the door to devoting an adequate amount of resources to what you're trying to accomplish in the amendment. I don't know if I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, do I take it that there is a potential amendment that's not being offered, uh, Commissioner Feldman? No, I was just offering my thoughts on the underlying amendment and the second, the, the secondary amendment. Okay. Well, in that case, I think we will move to vote on the amended amendment. And well, we have to actually procedurally we have to move to adopt the amended amendment to the amendment and then we have vote I on thought the I thought we did have right. that and right. let me just clarify what the amendment to the amendment would be is that it would uh, require that this provision be resourced neutral relative to the resources staff already dedicated is planning to dedicate to this and that staff would make any necessary conforming changes to the text to reflect that. Uh, yeah, and I actually thought that the words consistent with dedicated resources did that, but if you I want to, to elaborate on that, that would be fine. Otherwise, uh, 
We've now heard the motion and we've had it seconded, so now I will turn to the vote on the amended amendment. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay? I don't believe that this is on the amended amendment. I believe this is on the amendment to the amendment. Right. Just and to it, clarify. It, yes, right. and that's so you're we, right. Can we start over on this yes. vote? Yes, we, yes have to, we, we have to adopt and make sure we understand what your amendment is. And I think it is, uh, insert the words, remain... Um, Resource neutral, consistent with consistent dedicated with, resources yeah. for and this remain, project. Uh, However staff wants to write a conforming amendment. I, I would leave it to them to do it so that it's consistent with the intent of not adding any additional resources to this dedicated project. Understood. Okay, and so if I understand correctly, and I'm w willing to be corrected, that once we have voted on the amendment to the amendment, then because that is subsumed, we will need to take a vote on the actual amendment. Correct. Yes, okay, all right. So on the amendment to the amendment, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? So just for clarification's sake, I'm going to say Commissioner um, Kay's amendment. I am voting yes. Okay, that's fine. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. So now we move to the, uh, full, the, the actual amendment as amended, and now I ask Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Biacco? Yes. And Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. The uh, amendment is passed. And Commissioner Burkle, uh, Commissioner Biacco, do you have additional amendments? I do. On page 14, under the heading Data Intake and Clearinghouse, uh, Code 13330, add the sentence, to further demonstrate CPSC's commitment as a data-driven agency, staff will identify, research, and evaluate other sources of data and data intake systems. I propose this amendment because uh, CPSC has long relied on NIST data, as well as IDI reports and medical examiner's reports and the information that we get from saferproducts.gov, which, and the hotline, and we know there are problems with saferproducts.gov. And I, these all have purpose and they all are relevant and they, they accomplish some things, but I need to, I do believe that the agency needs to explore other sources of data intake. Um, we, we use the term data-driven agency and my amendment seeks to expand our data resources um, and ultimately our analysis. And I'd ask that this sentence be inserted so that the staff can um, uh, research additional data sources. Is there a second? Second. Um, and so uh, I would just ask one question. What specifics uh, do you have in mind for other sources of data and data intake systems that we are not exploring? Because as you recall, in mid-year uh, and in the budget, we have uh, added uh, e exploring ideas such as urgent care uh, uh, facilities, but what, what specifics do you have in mind that are not already included in our work plans? The urgent care stuff is just expanding on the NIST data. Um, actually, Acting Chair Adler, that is exactly the reason for the amendment. I, I don't know the different sources of information out there and the scope of that. That's what I'm asking the, um, the staff to do. So it's an unspecified, undetermined uh, set of data and data sources, and I guess my reaction to that would be, uh, if there's one area where I think the staff has been extraordinarily conscientious, it is in looking at other data and data sources. So I, I have absolutely no objection whatsoever to the spirit of the amendment. I fully concur with that. My problem with it is that it's sending a signal that we're not already doing that, and that is a proposition with which I disagree. Um, Commissioner uh, Burkle, any additional questions or comments? No, I intend to support the amendment and uh, appreciate, um, I think, staff being, uh, and I agree with Commissioner or Acting Chair Adler that this is not to say staff isn't doing uh, and looking for other sources of data. This is something we've expanded the fields in NICE data. We've, we're looking, uh, and certainly with retailer reporting and other, there's a lot of other sources where we could be getting more information, but this is just, I think, a, a puts a fine point on what staff should be doing and making sure we're not, we're doing exhaustive uh, research and paying attention to where we can source our data. So I thank you for the amendment. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, conceptually, again, I support uh, everything that Commissioner Burkle said as well about staff looking for certain data that it might not have access to. 
I would just say from my perspective, this uh, has been done repeatedly in the time that I've been at the agency, at least that's my understanding. And I feel like we went through the cycle when we had our data hearing, which preceded the two of you a few years ago, where we heard from a bunch of stakeholders and we were told about all these data sources that we should be taking a look at that uh, supposedly yielded a lot of promise. I'm not sure how many ended up yielding a lot of promise. And so I feel like what came out of that was actually this more refined approach by staff to look at certain targeted data sets such as urgent care centers and I wouldn't want to go back and start that process over again when I feel like they had already moved to this stage. So uh, what I would encourage though is that uh, maybe we have staff brief us at some point about where they are on data sources and if we feel that there are unexplored areas or that uh, there's a reason that this amendment should be adopted in the later, maybe mid-year would be an appropriate time after a briefing like that. I just feel like based on the time that I've been here that this has already been done very recently and uh, might be redundant. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Um, I support this amendment and view it as consistent with other efforts today uh, to, to uh, I expand the sources of data that the agency, uh, that the agency processes and our processing capabilities be it through uh, addressing skills gaps with respect to uh, uh, agency staff and uh, ability to understand large data sets, uh, be that through in individual expertise or through artificial intelligence. But I think this is a good amendment and I'm prepared to vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Biacco, any additional comments? Just that I, I think uh, Commissioner Kay's points um, actually support the uh, the amendment. I, I'm glad to hear that um, bef before me this um, the, it's ex these exploratory efforts yielded additional data sources. And since we're two years plus past, um, I, I would think that we have even newer data sources out there. So um, it, it seems to uh, to me that we should continue those efforts. Uh, and I just had one comment. I think that Commissioner Kay made an excellent suggestion. One of the, suggestion, one of the things that I'm uh, committed to doing is to have more briefings before the Commission on important issues. This strikes me as one where it would be extremely useful to have an additional briefing from staff on data sources. So if you all will remind me at some appropriate point, I think that would be a good topic for discussion. Are there additional questions or comments? If not, then uh, we will take a vote. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote no. The votes are three and the three yes and two no. The uh, amendment is carried. Commissioner Biacco, additional amendments? I do. On page 17, I would like to, I move to delete the nanotechnology program at code 23704. Um, I'm not opposed to exploring nanotechnology. I just understand that we've done it a few times. Other agencies are doing it. And uh, as you've heard today and on every occasion, we do discuss um, how limited our resources are. And having, um, having heard all the different amendments and the different projects that the various commissioners are interested in, I don't think this one takes priority here. Uh, is there a second to this amendment? Second. Thank you. We'll now have uh, comments and questions. And let me say, uh, I seem to recall, Commissioner Biacco, that when you and I were at lunch and we were discussing various aspects of the agency and I was voicing some skepticism about uh, the work that the agency does on nanotechnology, I would not want those comments then to govern uh, th this amendment because I do think there are some important aspects to nanotechnology that only the Consumer Product Safety Commission can do and that relates to the safety of consumer products. And far from deploring the fact that we have really not discovered serious hazards that I know of with respect to nanotechnology, we should be celebrating that fact so that nanotechnology has not become uh, one of those uh, clobber you from behind issues that uh, we, we really weren't prepared to deal with. So uh, again, this is one where I have a lot of sympathy for your amendment, but it's one I'm going to oppose. Commissioner uh, Burkle. Thank you. Um, I certainly understand the spirit of this amendment, and it's something that I grappled with when I first came to the agency. And in the period of time that I've been here, this number has been significantly reduced over the years. I think we're now talking about an amount of money that allows staff to be involved with other government agencies, to, uh, to be paying attention to and attending conferences to see what else is going on out there within the world of nanotechnology. 
I do see it uh, on some level as an emerging hazard or has the potential to be an emerging hazard and something we should have our finger on the pulse of. So I think we've gotten this number down to a very uh, reasonable amount from, I believe originally it was at two million. This is significantly less. I'm comfortable keeping it where it is. I think it allows the agency to, and our staff and the experts on our staff to do what they need to do just to know what else is going on within the government. To your point, to avoid duplication and to make sure we have our finger on the pulse. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. I'm not sure what happened at lunch, but it seems that Commissioner Burke and I have the same talking points all of a sudden. <laughs> um, I uh, am right there with Commissioner Burke all. I actually think this is a tremendous success story of government coordination, and we're going to talk later, I think, about IOT and government coordination, and this is actually a model for how that can work. Back when the National Nanotechnology Initiative was created during the Clinton administration, billions of dollars have been dedicated by the federal government toward nanotechnology research. But what's interesting about that is 93% of that money, at least as up to a couple of years ago, was on the promotion of commercialization of nanotechnology, and only 7% was to assessing the health and safety. So if you take that smaller amount of money, we are a part of that tiny part of that pie. And then the role that we have played is actually unique. We're the only agency, every because it's been such a successful coordination, the agencies have divvied up the responsibilities and there is not an overlap between what we do and what others do. There's definitely coordination in terms of the information shared and the knowledge that's gained, but we play a critical role in assessing the exposure from consumer products or from nanotechnology in consumer products and have played a cr critical role with the money that we've had in developing important test methods for that detection. And so Commissioner Burkle's right on as, is, as Chairman Adler, there's no reason to allow this to, to sort of fade away and come up and bite us. It is a very small amount of money relative to the payoff that we get. And it was only a few years ago that we actually sought to really start a nanotechnology center with some universities because of the continued need for it. And just from a health perspective, it's not like OFRs where they present themselves um, through changes to the cells, the difference is that with nanotechnology, the concern is that they mirror asbestos fibers and that they, you can breathe the technology in as it's released from the products. And so I think there's unexplored areas. The staff is serving a great part of a larger, well-coordinated United States government mission on health and safety. And for those reasons, I would prefer to see the money stay in there. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Um, Nanotechnology did not pan out to be the emerging hazard boogeyman that it was initially made out to be. And that's why you've seen agency resources over the years cut and cut and cut to the size that it is right now. Um, I, I think I'm generally agnostic on, 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 on the amendment here. Uh, I think that there are other resources within the agency, if that's what the, and uh, in, in within the operating plan as it's drafted, if the intent here is to keep our finger on the pulse of, of emerging hazards, uh, in, in the spirit of compromise, and because I believe that commissioners should have their priorities reflected in the operating plan, I'm inclined to support this. So thank you. Commissioner Biacco, any closing remarks? Yeah, I, you know, my, I agree with Commissioner Feldman that this, up to now, has not turned out to be what we anticipated from a safety perspective it would be. That does not mean to say it won't be applied in different um, situations. My attempt here was not to diss nanotechnology pro projects. I was looking for ways to tighten our op plan and move sources to areas where um, I, I thought they would be better spent, we get a bigger return. Um, I was also concerned that we had taken this down to a point where um, we're just keeping our hand on the pulse of it. And, and from that perspective, um, if that's what the goal here is, is to just make sure we understand and, and don't uh, overlook something, then I'm going to withdraw it. Okay. Uh, feel free to do that, and we will mark that off of the uh, vote. And do you have an additional amendment? I do. Um, on page 18, under um, code 25727, uh, burden. I'm sorry. I've just been told that there is a procedural issue here, and that is that your withdrawing of the amendment requires a second. You, I'm asking, do we need a second? Oh, do we need a second? To withdraw? To withdraw, yeah. I don't.
Okay. I don't think so. We okay. can vote it because it's obviously going to get voted down. It's going to have the same result. No, I think I think it's just fine to withdraw it. So consider it withdrawn. Thank you. Um, on page 18, under section code um, 257. Two seven burden reduction in the second paragraph of the first sentence after manufactured fiber I uh, moved to add quote and a briefing package with final action recommendations for testing exemptions for spandex fibers end quote um, uh, the full sentence then will read in fiscal year 2020 CPSC staff will provide a briefing package with a final action recommendation for potential determinations for manufactured fibers and a briefing package with final action recommendations for testing exemptions for spandex fibers for commission consideration. Um, end quote. This amendment seeks to continue the work on burden reduction as it relates to spandex. And earlier this year, we put out a request for comments. Um, that period has ended. And I do believe that when the commission can reduce costs of existing rules, regulations, or practices without increasing risks to consumers, we have an obligation to do so. And I think this is a prime example. Is there a second to this amendment? Second. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments at this point? I have none. Uh, Commissioner Burkle? I just want to commend my colleagues. Hey, bravo. Uh, we have been remiss on burden reduction. I hope this amendment will get passed and we can move forward in providing some relief uh, and not jeopardizing safety. I think we can do uh, both of those things at the same time. Thank you. Commissioner Kay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I can just ask of the sponsor, so there's two parts to this amendment. One is to basically do a final rule on fibers, and the second part is to do a final rule on spandex, is correct. that correct? And so, wait, wait, no, 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 briefing package. Final for, action. So what's the difference? So um, I want the staff to uh, have some room to tell us whether we need um, anything additional. I see, so is there room in here for staff to come back and basically say, we've read everything in the RFI, we've considered all the testing data that industry has provided, we just don't agree that they qualify for an exemption? Is that within the room of this, within the scope of this? Is that final action? And I'll, I'll change it to final rule. Okay, so you do intend there to be a specific I action? Do. I do. So are you making a motion to change it? I am, it? I okay. am. Uh, it's my mistake. So I'm going to uh, change the word action in two point parts to rule. Um, may I have a copy of what your final amendment yeah, <laughs> reads? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no. Thank That's you very mistake. much. Um, uh, Commissioner Feldman, do you have comments? In the meantime, while you're making your comments or asking any questions, I'm no, going to read. I just want to commend Commissioner Biacco. You've been a leader on this issue in particular, and I think that's a benefit both to the apparel industry and to consumers alike. Uh, I think that there's more that can and should be done on burden reduction uh, in this op plan and in general. Therefore, I intend to be supportive, and thank you for offering it. Um, I'm a little little confused because, uh, and staff, please correct me if I'm wrong, when it comes to spandex, we are not at the point of staff drafting a package for a final rule that the staff is working on a package, if anything, for a notice of proposed rulemaking. Am I correct in that? Uh, we did uh, put out a request for comments. Uh, we've received those comments in the plan work this year, was to review those comments. And we do believe there may be additional technical work before we could get to a proposed rule stage uh, at this point. That's, that's what was proposed in the operating plan. So we've not reached the point even of drafting a briefing package for a notice of proposed rulemaking yet, let alone that's one correct. for a final rule? That's correct. Okay. With, with that uh, information, then uh, I, appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the sentiment, and I, and I do want to commend First of all, going back some point in time, Commissioner uh, and then Acting Chair Burkle for being a relentless champion for burden reduction activities at the agency. And uh, that helped give us a much broader perspective on the workflow that we have and I think helped sensitize us to the concerns, especially of small business, with respect to uh, burden reduction. Uh, I'm all in favor of doing work on burden reduction, but at this point, uh, my biggest objection is strictly procedural, and, and that is we're, we're jumping the gun 
to move to a final rule before we've even decided whether or not uh, there's sufficient technical support for a notice of proposed rulemaking. So, uh, uh, Commissioner Biaco, do you care to respond, or I'll go around and ask for other comments? Nope. Uh, Commissioner uh, Burkle? No comments. Commissioner Kay? Uh, I guess I would ask if we have any sense of the resource implications of not only jumping an NPR but going to a final rule. Do we have any idea of the staff months that that would cause? I, I was under the impression that this has been pending for some time and we were just waiting for the comment period to end and, and to move forward on it. That was my understanding. Okay. I'm sorry to have to ask Mr. Ray to come back up. I apologize, Mr. Ray. Just to seek clarification, so as I understand the amendment in front of us, there's two parts to it. One would do a final rule on manufactured fibers, which I believe is already baked into the staff proposed operating plan, so that part's resource neutral, that, correct? That's correct. We've okay. already, we already have that. In okay, the so plan. that part I'm fine with. The second part, as I understand it, as it's been amended, amended would we, if it's pass, passed and the operating plan would require staff to include in its work a final rule, so not only an NPR, and, but also a final rule. Do you have any sense of the staff months that it would take to do that? It would be a guess at this point. Um, I, what I can say is we did not build that staff, the staff resources in to do both the rules. I think as, as I described, it was to review the comments and any additional technical work that was needed. Um, we could come back to the commission with resource estimates on what that would take. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't have that right here in front of me. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. And so, so just, I, sorry, I, go I, ahead, please. I was under the impression that this was supposed to come up in 2019. I have been waiting for it to come up then. I know there was uh, uh, some information on that. I am surprised to hear that we're not ready. I thought we were just waiting for additional comments and it was time to move forward on this. I think that. This is just my sense. The fact that something might be on a list to get done and something has been, has resources allocated to actually get it done are two different things. And so you are probably correct that a certain period of time has passed since the next step has been funded in essence, but I don't, I think what we're talking about now is how would we pay for doing that next step in terms of staff months. And when we asked staff earlier, uh, I thought that they had said, which was a, a, really, a slightly different question, which was just for the NPR stage, was 30 staff months. Obviously, this is well beyond that because this is also a final rule. And so that would just be my concern because that, that has to come from somewhere. And so if there were a way to, if this is already incorporated into staff's work, which it sounds like it's not, then that's a different story. But I would oppose it in its current form based on the resource implications. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, did you have a comment or question? I did for, for Mr. Ray before he, <laughs> <laughs> before he sneaks off. Um, I wanted to ask a question. If the language in Commissioner Biaco's amendment was changed back to a final action, is, then, is that something with, with that language, could we then contemplate, maybe this is a legal question, uh, some sort of, um, some sort of uh, yeah, in, uh, enforcement discretion? And I think I did, you're right, I did have that in my mind now, now, that I, now that you mention it. I'm not completely tracking the question where we're at on the uh, so amendments. So the original language of Commissioner Biaco's amendment mm. is final action recommendations. You're right, you're right. And so I think what was intended was not so much getting to a final rule, but rather enforcement discretion as we've done in some other situations. Um, I think if the question was we would review the open comments and come with a recommendation to the commission on what that says, I mean, we could put a package together. I'm not sure, at least my understanding on the early review is I'm not sure we have the technical basis to support it fully. And that, I think that's the challenge right now as I understand it. I, th I think we got some information from the request for comments. I don't think we have the full information we were hope hoping to get through that that would help to, to provide the technical basis for any enforcement discretion. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, additional questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Biaco? No, I just want to thank uh, uh, Commissioner Burkle for pointing that out. I knew there was a reason. Um, I had it written down. I, I'm tired, so thank you for pointing that out. It, it was an action that I did want. Uh, Which is why I got so confused with the timing. I was expecting that to come up. 
So just for clarification, what is the amendment you have before us? Is the amendment the yes, original yes, amendment? I, original amendment, yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Look, we're, we're all struggling and no one more than uh, yours truly. Mr. Um, Chairman, may I, will we have one more opportunity? Oh, yeah, was I, was, a, I was I was. I didn't know if Commissioner Burkle wanted to add anything else first, though. No, I was just going to ask the same question. What is the language of this final amendment? It is final action, action yes. rec recommendation. The we did that. And so, uh, again, reluctantly, as much as I support all efforts towards burden reduction, the notion of final action is still sufficiently unclear to me so that I just don't understand what the resource implications of it are. If we had the chance to sit down and, uh, and do careful, more careful drafting of it, I might end up supporting it, but at least as in its current incarnation, I, I'm going to oppose it. Uh, come sure. You mean like the consumer ombudsman? No, no, not at all like the consumer ombudsman. That one's clear and concrete. Uh, Commissioner Burkle? In the eyes of the beholder, Bob. <laughs> um, are you taking a vote? No, I'm asking if you have, have additional no comments because I think uh, Commissioner Kay may well. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The only additional comment I would make is it sounds like, even beyond the resource issues, that to Mr. Ray's point, there's just additional technical work that staff is planning. And so I would. Um, be happy to revisit this issue at the mid-year, maybe once that technical work is done, and see if at that point there's a resource um, efficient way to execute whatever staff believes is uh, consistent with safety and burden reduction. Thank you. Additional comments? If not, uh, then we will move to a vote. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote no. It's three uh, in favor to oppose the amendment. Passes. Commissioner uh, Biacco, do you have additional uh, amendments? I do. Just for the record, I will not be presenting um, my amendment number eight. Um, it really was a technical amendment that would have gone with um, a previous amendment, but I believe that it's um, taken care of by the language that was proposed. Um, uh, my amendments nine and ten go together. Um, I would like to take them out of order because nine, they're presented in the page number order, but let's take, um, take them together. Substantively, number 10, um, on page 36, under summary of key performance measures, OCM, I'd like to uh, strike, I move to strike control ID 2020 KM 4.3.01. This sets forth a number of collaboration activities initiated with stakeholders as 55 and delete the corresponding key performance measure statement on page 44. Um, I, I, I fully support our, our Office of Communications collaborating with stakeholders to promote information and education safety campaigns, but I can't support including a key performance measure of 55. Um, it's, first of all, it's an increase of 26 activities from last year. I don't know what the resource implications of that, uh, what that would be. And I think we need to be more thoughtful and uh, methodical in our collaborative activities and not merely trying to meet a quota that I don't know where this number comes from. It's just a number. And I don't want to see the agency looking to meet their quota um, by looking for things that maybe are not, we're not getting critical safety information to consumers um, that we should be. Um, so I, I would just move to strike that number. Uh, do I understand that you are combining your two amendments, or do you, are you taking the second amendment first and then we're moving to the prior amendment? Well, the, my amendment number nine is, uh, would be on page 35. It goes together, and I would just say um, to insert the third bullet collaboration with stakeholder groups for INE activities approved by the commission. Um, before we ask for a second, alas, <laughs> you had me on the first amendment, but you don't have me on the second amendment. And we'll the separate them. I was just trying to make it a little easy. But I certainly appreciate okay, that. Okay, we can. Uh, let's, so let's go with the first one then. Um, okay, and having heard you describe it, is there a second to that amendment? Number ten. Sorry, second it. But which one are we doing first? Ten. Okay, thank you. This is a point of clarification. I think it's actually nine, not nine and ten, because we removed. It, the, we combined our OFR amendment, so I think that gives you one less, but I'm not sure that's even there. It, yeah, it's just as just Hereafter, so you know which known paper. as Amendment 9, even if it's not the Ninth Amendment. It is the one that strikes the 55 number. How's that? Okay. Um, and so do we have a second on that? Yes. Second. Okay. And so uh, 
may I say that this is the one uh, amendment that I don't support. Um, I think you have uh, talked to the staff as though the quota was imposed upon them. This is an internally generated quota that the staff came up with. And if you recall during the briefing on the op plan, with raised eyebrows, I asked uh, uh, whether this really was what the staff was contemplating. Uh, and Mr. Martiak said, yes, it is. And similarly, uh, and I'm surprised you don't have an amendment on this, they also uh, proposed to increase the number of Twitter and other CPSC social media accounts from 30,000 to 85,000. And so God bless them for being aggressive, but if staff says this is what they want to do, uh, then let's applaud and support their efforts. Let's not limit them. So uh, this, this is one that uh, uh, I, I hope we see that they actually live up to their, their internally generated uh, uh, goals, but I, I really don't want to quash their uh, their uh, ambitions. So uh, uh, that would be my reason for opposing it, Commissioner uh, Burkle. Um, I, I will say that I contemplated taking the the first amendment, what I'm referring to as eight, but the information educational outreach campaign, that amendment first, and then depending on how the outcome of that amendment, whether or not we would weigh in with the 55. Um, to Commissioner or Acting Chairman Adler's point, staff generally um, makes their own determination as to how many uh, activities they want to accomplish uh, in order that they can achieve their goals. I think for me, understanding how you're defining collaboration, whether it's in either one of these amendments is important because I'm not sure it's consistent with how OCM is defining their collaboration. Well, and that's, uh, that's part of my problem. I mean, it just, it's just so arbitrary and I don't know what this means. I, I don't know, you know, what messages they could sit and say, we're gonna do 55 of these and we're gonna collaborate with, I don't know who and to what extent. I, I just think it's arbitrary, it's undefined, and it, it could also be limiting. So uh, that's why I would, that's why I've moved in both of these regards. I do think for OCM, uh, and, and I think they're not the only um, organization within CPSC that does collaborative activities, um, but in this particular amendment, we're talking about OCM, um, I think that they, wouldn't they have a good idea of how they're going to achieve this goal and they do have the specifics spelled out and i think there's that what they already intend to do but then beyond that there's going to be opportunities like we saw recently i will say with uh, elevators or inclined sleepers or where the interaction and the collaboration and all of the those issues kind of percolate up out of nowhere they're not planned for and then they have to take on uh, those on as well but I, I think that probably if we asked OCM, they would be able to define how they got to that 55 pretty easily. Thank you. Commissioner Kay? I have nothing to add. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Feldman? I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Biacco, any closing comments? If not, then we will move to a vote. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. We're voting on what we will hear 55, now called removal of the, the removal of the 55, and you're voting to approve the uh, removal of the 55 as a goal. That's correct. Okay. Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Biacco? Yep. Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote no. Uh, the uh, amendment passes, uh, and we now move, I believe, to your, what we now will known as Amendment 9, whether or not it's the Ninth Amendment. Uh, on page 35, under um, code 42549, Information and Education INE Outreach Campaign, just move to add the third as a third bullet, the sentence collaboration with stakeholder groups for an INE activities approved by the commission. Uh, thank you. Is there a second to this amendment? Second. Uh, at which point we will um, discuss uh, the amendment, and it is an amendment that I uh, support. Uh, as I read it, it calls for collaborative efforts with stakeholders for INE activities approved by the commission. I think that's a good idea. I support it. Uh, let me add, I don't read the amendment as necessarily requiring INE outreach campaigns to be approved by the commission, and I don't read it as precluding outreach on INE outreach, 
uh, outreach on INE campaigns that have not been approved by the commission. So with that understanding, I uh, support it. Uh, Commissioner Burkle. So I'm trying to understand um, collaboration with stakeholder groups for INE activities must be approved by the commission. Is there, there's no must, is this, this just should be? Will be, I, I must think, be? I think it's drafted this way for a couple of reasons. One, there are some INE activities that don't require commission approval. But what I, what I don't, what I, and the reason it's drafted this way is because I will not support safety messages that OCM decides that are not based on data or approved by the commission that under our statute require that. Um, for example, they cannot say this product is defective if the staff has not made that determination um, prior. So I did not want to leave out approved by the commission, and I did not want to make it must, which is why it's drafted that way. I think it's um, assumed that OCM is not going to have um, blanket authority to make decisions that ha are inconsistent with the statute. Well, I guess my first um, comment would be that I don't believe that OCM would put out a statement calling a product defective without knowing uh, that 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 determination has been made by staff. I think that OCM works very closely with EPI, with compliance in trying to understand all of the moving parts. But so, like, again, I'm, I'm unclear. The club, what, it, what are we talking about with collaboration? Um, and what are we talking about with INE activity? So we do a tremendous amount of outreach with Pool Safely. So every time we interact with, I mean, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of groups to help push out our message and to help us with this pool safely and to take the pool safely pledge and to work with the Phelps Foundation and other foundations um, to push out our message, is that collaboration and would that all have to come to the commission? Well, I believe that's already been approved by the commission and it's something that the agency does and I don't think they have to come back and ask us. But if there's something new, um, I do think that you know, if the statute and our regs require it, they need to let us know. My, my point is I want to ensure that we don't have um, safety messages going out that um, would require um, Commission approval or following the statute. I, I've seen that a couple of times. Okay, I, and I guess I would disagree with that because anything that OCM puts out has to go through 6B clearance and their eyes are not the only eyes on any kind of campaign and or um, press release or any information that we're pushing out as an agency. There's quite a, an elaborate oversight um, mechanism in place to make sure that you know, incorrect in uh, data is not being pushed out by our communications officer and office. But I just, I guess, so then if we've a, how do we distinguish between, I'll say, pool safely and our tip over campaign and some of the other larger ones, then how do we define the other INE campaigns? Something, it's just vague. How will OCM know what needs to get approved? And, and if they don't have um, the approval or hasn't been pre-approved, then they should make sure just as they run 6B stuff by I don't know whom, um, not us, um, but that there's commission approval. Whether it was prior approval or going forward for something new. It, it's, it's presented as it's presented. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. I support the amendment. Commissioner Feldman. Uh, the amendment, as I read it, would allow for additional commission input into stakeholder collaboration. I think that's a good thing, and I have no questions. Um, well, I do have an additional comment, and I would just want to say that I've heard your expression of intent, but I am going with, uh, as uh, former Supreme Court uh, member Nino Scalia would say, I'm going with the actual language that's there, and as I read that language, it does not require the commission to approve I and E campaigns. It says, in the event that we have approved one, then we will engage in these collaborative efforts. That's what I'm voting on. I'm not voting to give authority to the commission that is not in the statute, although I have no problem with the commission uh, directing staff to work on specific I and E campaigns, but I do not read this, and I, my vote was not contingent upon any 
need for the commission approval for I and E campaigns. I see nothing in the statute that requires that. So with those qualifications, I'm prepared to support the amendment. Uh, are there additional I don't accept those qualifications as, as you see it. So if, if that's how you want to vote based on that, that's fine. But the amendment is presented as it is. Well, as it is, uh, I, with your clarification, you have now persuaded me to vote against it. And I think that's fine. Uh, we will now move to a final vote unless there are other comments. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? No. Uh, Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Feldman, um, excuse me, Commissioner Biacco? Yes. And Commissioner Feldman? Yes. So, uh, and I vote no, so the uh, vote, the amendment is carried. Uh, and do you have additional amendments? Almost done, honest. <laughs> um, uh, on page 40, under fiscal year 2020 milestone, a statement for EXIT, uh, strike the description for control ID number 2020M52 and replace with complete updates and, uh, and upgrades to uh, saferproducts.gov, which includes, among other things, enhancements to user experience, such as making the website mobile friendly and improving search capabilities. Uh, I present this motion. We, we've approved um, at the mid-year $590,000 um, to do this. Um, I, I, I'd like, I want to make sure that it's, it, it's expressly put in the op plan that we get this done. We have heard um, time and time again from our stakeholders and consumer groups that this is um, something that they want to see completed, and that is the purpose of my amend amendment. Thank you. Is there a second to the amendment? Second. Thank you. We'll now uh, have questions or comments. Uh, I have no questions or comments at this time. Uh, Commissioner Burkle. I just want to uh, commend Commissioner Biacco, and um, I appreciate this amendment. Um, she, I think it was one of the first hearings we had when she came on board. We had the saferproducts.gov hearing. This has been uh, something that has been important to me, making safer products more user-friendly. Um, helping uh, the consumer be able to navigate through the system, be able to report accurately and promptly. So I, um, I'm very um, appreciative of her amendment and hope that this will get passed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kay? I support the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Feldman? I support the amendment as well. Okay. Um, my only comment is uh, I certainly don't oppose updating and upgrading safer products. I grant that we've already approved this. this doesn't, to me, add certainly any resource uh, uh, expenditures. Uh, and so, I mean, we do get to a point where we're voting to approve a second time things that we've already approved. Um, that said, I probably will support it. Uh, and we now, unless there are additional comments, uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, it is unanimously passed. Uh, Commissioner Biacco, additional yes, this amendments. Yes, is, this is my last amendment, and it goes, um, it, it, it's a follow-up to my previous amendment, which is on page 40, just simply to add another row uh, under control ID number 202M62 with the following sentence, complete update and upgrades to CPSC website. It's just, it would just be a technical amendment to make it consistent. Okay. Uh, is there a second to this amendment? Second. Thank you. Um, I don't have any comments about this. Uh, uh, Commissioner B uh, Burkle? Um, I guess my first question would be have, whether this has been uh, discussed with IT, and we know with the financial and uh, staff hours, the resource implications are, well, and what this would entail. This, this just... Um, clarifies or makes consistent the amendment we just adopted and and I, I would answer your question yes um, we have approved the money I, this is just to make sure it's in the op plan so that we can be accountable for it it was in my opinion lacking I guess I'm confused um, the amendment we just passed for saferproducts.gov yes well this is CPSC's website uh, I understand I understand your confusion okay um, I understood uh, same same concept that this has already been something that we've addressed um, that we have been working on. I want to see it um, completed. Okay. Do we know um, what staff is working on currently, or where they're at? With I don't know where they're at, and that's one of the reasons for the amendment. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. 
Uh, I would like to support the amendment. I guess I'm sort of where Commissioner Burkle is. If there's any way to understand, um, consistent with the burden reduction approach I took, like what's what will this entail? But if we can, if that were information that were readily available, um, or if this similar to the other amendment where you're intending for it to be resource neutral relative to what's in the operating plan already, that's fine too. Well, we've been talking about this for quite some time. This isn't a database. I mean, we the last time we had a hearing on some of these issues, we heard about broken links and uh, things that weren't ac accessible from the outside. I'd like to see that done. Uh, it's it's something we've been talking about for some time. It's been on our, our radar. We've taken uh, and we've assured our uh, consumer advocate groups that we would fix these um, flaws, and, and this is what this is intended for. Uh, again, holding ourselves accountable for something we have been representing that we are fixing. And so I guess I'm, I don't know who would be the appropriate person to answer this, but is this already in the operating plan to do this work? Uh, the answer, it, it depends on what it is. I think we do have an ongoing kind of maintain and keep the website updated um, work built in, but I think in the 2021 request, we specifically tried to request additional funds to do a broader update of the public website to address some of the bigger issues. So I'm, I'm not entirely clear on the, the what, but I, I think that's what's currently planned. Well, and, and let me uh, just uh, call the commission's attention to the op plan at page 39, uh, code 99953, which is website management. And it already accounts for um, uh, the, pro the project um, that provides resources for operating and maintaining the CPS web websites to meet the needs of the agencies, consumers, businesses, and other stakeholders. And it does go on. My, my amendment is just to add a bullet point um, that reflects this in, in the appropriate section. So I, I think it's my time still. Um, if the, uh, uh, so if the amendment is basically saying then that this is a bullet point that is reflecting the, wor uh, the work that's already in the operating plan, is that what you're saying? I, I want to make sure that we arrive um, at goals and hold ourselves accountable sure. that we set out to complete. So, so what does completed mean to you? Because obviously there's two different versions of completed. There's the completed that reflects the code that you just read, 99953, and whatever they intend to do there would get completed by that goal. But then there's also completed, meaning what Mr. Ray was saying, that we've asked for more money to do a whole additional upgrade it would help to know which completed you meant. Both. Okay. So, but without the resources for it. Because I'm totally supportive of whether it's a mid-year process or some other way, if the resources are identified and we can have a sense of that, this concept, it's just in, it's hard to do it out of context with that. I think that this, adding a bullet point does not change the op plan, it just makes it more consistent. Okay. Somebody's whispering, it's a milestone. I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to mean. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Um, there are many bright spots at CPSC. CPSC.gov is not one of them. Um, I think everybody at the dais would agree that updates and upgrades to our public facing website are sorely needed. Uh, that work appears to be reflected in the op plan as it's currently drafted. I think the additional accountability in the form of a milestone statement isn't a bad idea. Therefore, I'm prepared to support this amendment. But would Commissioner Feldman yield though for a question? Yes, sir. But is it your understanding that that milestone would require additional resources that are not currently allocated in the operating plan to complete? I don't want to success, or set staff up to fail. If they're being asked to complete a milestone that the commission is not allocating the resources for, I don't think that's fair for staff. If the milestone is just to reflect the work that staff has already budgeted for, I'm on board. So it helps to understand which milestone you mean? Um, I, I, I believe it, it would be reflective of the, of the work that's being currently called for in the op plan. Um, it, it would be internally consistent to have this milestone relate back to the, uh, to, to the, to the project that Commissioner Biacco called out. I have not independently uh, shopped this amendment language with staff for feedback. I think that would be a, sta uh, 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 a question for staff or, or, or for somebody else. Um, but again, I'm generally supportive of milestone statements. I think that sure. gives a, a, a good barometer on which to gauge 
progress in one direction uh, or, or the other or, or inaction if the, the case may be that. Um, if this is something that doesn't pass also, perhaps, you know, addressing this at, at, at mid-year would be the appropriate, uh, maybe a, a, an additional appropriate forum, and I, I hope we'd be able to continue to work on, on that, but. May I use a little more of your time then? So I would be fine if it said completed planned update and upgrades to CPSC's website, because I think that implies that it's planned within the fiscal year. And then have an additional component that would, or an understanding that we would see at mid-year what any additional work would, would cost. I suppose I'm agnostic, but would defer to the amendment sponsor whether she thinks that makes sense. I don't think it changes it, but if that makes you more comfortable, that's fine. I'm going out of order here, um, but I know I didn't use my time before. Um, this actually works better, I think. <laughs> I, the the question I have is, are you, because maybe I'm misunderstanding, complete update and upgrades to CPSC's website, are you saying that what's uh, enumerated here in the ops plan, standard, standardization of file naming conventions and metadata population process, improvements to overall site organization, review of website visitor statistics to inform people, are you saying that that's what would be completed? I, I am. I, I, I can't say that we would ever, I mean, it would be silly to say there's not going to be any more adjustments, upgrades to the CP, Agreed. to the Agreed. website in the future, but what we're, let's get what we have on the books done. So that's why I, I addressed, Elliot, your, your point about, or Commissioner K, about if, if planned helps, um, that's fine too. I mean, it's implied. I mean, for me, that would be the difference of being supportive or not, because that would provide the clarity that would give I, me I don't comfort. think it changes my intent, so I'm happy to add it and accept your friendly amendment. Um, do we really have to go through a voting <laughs> on the amendment to the amendment? Um, I, I actually can accept, um, I, my understanding of procedure, kay. I can accept the friendly amendment, and then we can vote. Okay, so then we'll vote on the uh, amendment with the friendly amendment uh, that some say is not needed, but it helps for uh, our voting purposes. So with that uh, in mind, uh, I will now ask for a vote. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous. And uh, congratulations, Commissioner. Ending on that one. Commissioner Biacco. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would suggest that we take a 15 minute break, which uh, would bring us to 2.30. I can do that math. So we will reconvene at 2.30. 2.35. 2 okay, we'll reconvene at 2.35. <laughs> All right, so we're taking a 20 minute break. Okay. In other words, you can't do that.
Welcome back to the continuation of the Consumer Product Safety Commission's deliberation and vote on its 2020 op plan. We now move to amendments uh, offered by Commissioner Feldman. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Uh, the first amendment that I am offering today uh, has to do with agency modernization, and it would modernize CPSC and expand agency expertise on emerging technologies in particular by hiring a chief technologist. Um, the amendment would uh, at the appropriate place in the, in, in the ops plan, insert the following language that in the fiscal year 2020, to expand agencies' expertise on innovation and the safety implications associated with emerging technologies, staff, in consultation with the commission, will allocate resources in one, FT, in one FTE at the discretion of the executive director and without negatively impacting the agency's safety mission for the purposes of hiring a chief technologist. Uh, additional explanation about that or? Um, it's a concept that shouldn't be unfamiliar because this isn't the first time that I've discussed it, uh, including on the dais here, but it's my goal that this would be a position that's modeled off of similar uh, roles at, at some of our sister agencies, including the Federal Trade Commission, FCC, NASA, OSTP, and others. Um, the chief technologist would be, and this is consistent with the uh, draft position description that I circulated earlier, um, in advance of uh, the decision of today, that uh, this, this individual would serve as the Commission's principal advisor on innovation and the safety implications associated with emerging tech. Um, the purpose here would not be to replicate any functions or roles that are currently within the agency and, and, and in place, but rather the role of the chief technologist would be to expand agency expertise and to provide the strategy and leadership across various offices here, uh, including on the seventh floor, with respect to and in support of the agency's mission on emerging tech, uh, including the Internet of Things and connected devices, uh, wearables, artificial intelligence, among other things. Um, it's my uh, hope that the chief technologist would serve as a sufficiently senior position uh, that it's a voice that would carry and resonate within the agency. Uh, the position description that I've drafted here uh, is a starting point. Um, as we discussed with, with previous amendments, um, it, this is aspirational language, uh, but by placing it in the ops plan and, and hopefully having it accepted into the ops plan, this would be a starting point for a more fulsome discussion. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, we will now have a round of questions and comments. Um, let me say that I support this amendment as written, and I just want to go out of my way to express my appreciation to you, Commissioner Feldman, for your willingness to collaborate and refine the proposal so it captures what you want uh, with this and the analytics position, uh, but adding them in a manner with what I consider to be consistent with current civil service requirements in the CPSC's statutory language. Uh, and I promised Commissioner Feldman I would uh, make the following comment, and that is uh, I plan to consult with him and our colleagues about the language of the position description for these appointments. I also promise to seek his and our colleagues' advice regarding candidates for these positions to make sure that everyone has an ample opportunity to offer advice and recommendations regarding any appointment to the position. These aren't positions that require formal commission approval, but they are uh, positions that are important enough so that there should be extensive consultation, and I promise to do that, so I thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burkle? May I reclaim some of my time? Yes, please. Um, in, in, in response, I appreciate those, those statements. I think uh, your statement right there does encapsulate the, the compromised nature of, of the amendment. It had been my initial hope that this would have been a, a, a role that would be hired uh, at, the, at the direction uh, and subject to a commission vote. Um, I, I, I understand uh, why you've suggested the, the language that, that you've done. Um, I appreciate your, your offer to do so in consultation with me. Uh, I think it's also important that, that that also be in consultation with Commissioner Biacco and Burkle and, and Kay. Uh, I think everybody uh, at, at the dais recognizes the skills gap that this amendment is designed to address, and therefore I would, I would hope that everybody has input on, on the process. Reminding you of what I said, I did say consulting with you and, the, and our colleagues. Yes, so you did. I just wanted to done. underscore the and our colleagues. Okay, well, I, I certainly appreciate that. Commissioner Burkle. I have no questions. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to commend uh, Commissioner Feldman. You're right, you have brought this up a number of times. and. You've been uh, really the leading voice since you've gotten here. 
on the need for the agency to modernize in these directions. And so the questions that I'm going to ask will probably be the same for both of them. And so as you've you've identified a need, and how have you satisfied yourself that the agency is currently constructed with our current skill sets is not meeting those needs? Uh, I think that's been uh, identified explicitly in uh, the strategic goals and uh, strategic skills gaps that are outlined in our policy and, and performance budget request. Um, I, I think that the nature of uh, the marketplace, the speed with which new technologies are being developed and deployed uh, in the hands of consumers from concept to manufacture to uh, sort of broad disbursement within the marketplace is happening at such a lightning quick pace that it makes sense that we have uh, some additional supplemental expertise at the agency so that we're not caught, caught flat-footed. A great example of that is hoverboards. Uh, this was something that certainly was not on the agency's radar, and you blinked, and they were everywhere, and there were problems associated with them. I think the agency was able to triage uh, and, and work uh, collaboratively and, and in, in, in partnership with UL to get a standard up quickly. Uh, I think having uh, a, a voice with some extra gravitas at the agency um, to inform how we proceed when crises, crises like this uh, do occur, I, I think would be to the benefit of everybody. And in safety and consumers. Thank you. And so, do you, I'm sorry if I missed this, but do you, if you envision a virtual org chart, where in your aspirational mind would this position sit in that org chart? Uh, ideally, this would be a position that would be uh, floating, and 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 I recognize the challenges of doing that, which I think was the nature of the conversation that that Bob and I had. Um, and, and, and the uh, justification behind some of the amendments that, uh, modifications that I made to the amendment um, in, in that you see reflected in the, in the current uh, form. Um, you know, I, I, I think for practical purposes, this is a, a position that would be under the executive director. It would be my hope that this would not be in, uh, housed within any one particular vertical because I think the expertise that this position would, would bring to the agency would inform uh, uh, any number of uh, different important functions that, that we currently conduct in advance of our safety mission. I see. So you envision it um, maybe like a separate bubble underneath the office of the executive director, not in the office of the executive director, but sort of separate? I think that those particulars are important. Mm -hmm. um, I think that those would be the subject of uh, the more detailed discussions that, that I hope we would have when we're hammering out the particulars of the position description. Um, and, and I think that goes to the point that Commissioner Ad or Chair Acting Chairman Adler made earlier, uh, that this is a discussion that, that we should be having, you know, a, a amongst the, the five of us. Got it. And do you envision that person ultimately needing his or her own staff? No, not necessarily. And that's not the model that other agencies have mm -hmm. employed. Okay. Um, similar to the questions that I asked during Commissioner Biacco's amendment, but really more of May, may I clarify that yes, as well? There's been some questions raised about whether the chief technologist would, would be uh, brought to the agency in a supervisory role. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that sort of, uh, uh, at the core of your question about whether they'd have their own staff, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily see this person as even being in a supervisory role, uh, uh, especially to the extent that that um, has an impact on, on this having a larger budgetary impact than, than I think I intend. Got it. And is this, do you know at other agencies, is this position filled in an SES capacity or a GS capacity? Um, there's different models. Uh, there are agencies that fill this with uh, some, some creative funding uh, in terms of expert witness allocations or, um, or, or you know, the way the, the specific project for the, the, the tenure of their time here. Um, and, and, and therefore, um, you know, that, that, that doesn't sort of fit neatly within an SES or a GS position. I think this would be a, a conversation that, that uh, would be important to, one, the five of us to have, but also to, to weigh on the, the, the thoughts and expertise of, uh, of human resources at, at, at the agency. But I hope that's not a sticking point. May I just go a little longer? Yes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so that is where I was going next. And Similar to the question that I asked of, of, of Chairman Adler during Commissioner Biacco's amendment on the uh, consumer ombudsman, I would hope that in this process that uh, 
this could really come from staff through their recommendations as opposed to being dictated top down because there are a lot of issues in terms of HR, facilities, um, turf, other things that need a lot of thought put into it for both of these positions to make sure that um, if everything's done that it doesn't create unintended problems and I wouldn't want us to force staff into a situation of having to that where they get distracted and we've created a giant mess for them so uh, I'm hopeful oh, that, I, that you're that we can build into this process something that is uh, very much solicitous of staff and respectful of how they believe something like this needs to be accomplished and gives them the maximum flexibility to do so. Chairman Adler, may I, may I respond yes, briefly? Yes, of course. Um, I, I appreciate those concerns. Thank you for raising them. Uh, this language is crafted very carefully to make sure that the role does not supplant uh, or otherwise frustrate existing roles within the agency. Um, uh, it's been crafted with some significant staff feedback already at this point. Um, and particularly with respect to the chief technologist, staff has identified a skills gap and, uh, and has, has given some positive indications that this is a role that would fill uh, uh, a, a, an unmet need in terms of agency expertise. So um, for that reason, I, I, I'm supportive of it. That's the reason I'm offering it. And uh, again, appreciate you raising those concerns. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Biaco. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Feldman, I, I support this concept. I know we've um, certainly talked about it um, at, at other hearings, and I've been an, a huge advocate of increasing the technology and um, the way we do things um, to be a little bit more modernized. So I appreciate your um, proposal here, and I'm, I'm inclined to, uh, to support it, but I need to have a couple clarifying points. Uh, do, do I understand uh, correctly that this chief technologist is being proposed to address a skills gap um, in the agency. Yes, exactly. And do you see um, this position as uh, one of leadership or, um, uh, yeah, one of leadership to the descriptions already in the op plan? It would be a leadership but a non-supervisory position. Uh, it's my hope that this individual be sufficiently senior within the organization uh, that uh, his or her uh, views, opinions, advice, input carry sufficient weight that it have in, in a, a positive impact on our understanding uh, and, and our ability to handle problems that, that I fear uh, we may otherwise be caught flat-footed when, when it, it comes time to address them. And, and this person would supplement um, uh, some of the um, skills and activities that we already have going on at the agency, right? Supplement but not be redundant of. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank uh, both Commissioner Kay and Commissioner Biaco for helping refine points I've discussed with uh, Commissioner Feldman, so I'm glad we put that on the record. Are there additional comments, questions? I have a couple questions based on the questions I just heard. Um, Commissioner Feldman, you mentioned a number of other agencies that you're, I'll say, modeling, not exactly, but somewhat, this position. I think you mentioned FTC, SEC, FAA. Uh, I'm not necessarily certain about SEC, and I'm not necessarily certain about FAA, but DOT definitely. Okay. My concern is not that this is a bad concept at all, but rather than those are much larger agencies with really, I'll say, infinite pools of money that we don't have. And so to Commissioner Kay's point, because I didn't hear the answer, what is the skills gap that we're trying to to fill or to address? The skills gap would be, uh, uh, the, the skills gap with respect to a number of emerging technologies that are on the horizon that, that staff has indicated uh, there are some gaps in understanding. Um, with respect to the, the budgetary impact, uh, we are talking about one FTE at this point. Um, so th therefore, I, 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 I don't anticipate the budgetary impact of this uh, being uh, uh, significant, um, e even e given the, the fact that these agencies tend to be on, on the larger side, although some of them are smaller. Um, does that answer your question? Well, a little bit. When you're saying that our staff would inform this person, 
that then means to me staff has identified the hazard and so they would look to this person to provide the expertise let's say you mentioned hoverboards with the lithium ion battery um, I mean I, we have that expertise but with lithium ion batteries but so I'm under trying to understand so our staff would identify the emerging hazards to this person and then this person would then what uh, th this person would then conduct research and and serve as a a node and nexus of uh, understanding and knowledge within the agency uh, to support the mission at, at, at various levels. Okay, so are you thinking in terms of a an academic to do research and to and are you thinking an expert? I guess my mother used to use the word the phrase jack of all trades master of none sometimes that's how i feel as a commissioner you get to dabble in a lot of issues you don't really have the um, you know the opportunity to really become an expert would this person be the expert would this person be the vehicle to go out and find the expertise i'm trying to understand again what what their role would be um, I, I think that the, the academic model that you raised is one that's been employed uh, to a great deal of success at other agencies, particularly with, with, with respect to the FCC. Um, they adopted the model where their chief technologist was brought on uh, from ap academia uh, to address a, a, a specific discrete issue during their tenure. Um, uh, the, the most current chief technologist, I believe, is working day and night to help solve the problem of uh, annoying robocalls which I think everybody can agree is a, a problem squarely within FCC's jurisdiction. Um, it, it may be that this person is brought on with, uh, with, with a, 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 a specific um, charge for a defined period of, 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 of term, be it a, a, a year term or longer. Um, but again, those are all details that I would welcome your input on the process going forward as we work to flesh out the particulars of the, of the, of the PD. Um, and. Uh, I, I, I think I think that there's a number of models that that make sense, and I think you hit on a number of them. Thank you. I I just want to just distinguish between a specific discrete issue because that may, to me, in, in my mind, that may be have more merit that you have someone come in to look at specifically an issue, but just to broadly hire them to be our technology officer. There's so many issues. You know, if it is just to focus on IoT, well, then that's not lithium-ion batteries. That's not the hoverboard. So, you know, it, it's just it's the devil is in the details. And I think, um, you know, I thank you for your work on this. But my concerns are just that we're not analogous. We just have jurisdiction over such a broad swath of products that having someone come in, it's it's a challenge. And we are still in the old mode where we're looking in the bricks and mortars and. And, and doing the defects from that and, and from reporting, 15B reporting, and then we want to have someone poised looking at the uh, emerging technology. So I think it's, we're not analogous to so many other agencies, and that's one of my concerns. I understand the concern. I, I think we would be able to address that in the position description to make sure that this person isn't a generalist but a specialist that's, that, that comes on board to, to tackle a specific project. And because these are emerging technologies and potentially emerging hazards, we may not know with specificity exactly what that is right now. Uh, but this would put us in as good a position as we possibly could be uh, to make sure that, again, we're not caught, ca caught flat-footed if and when a crisis arises. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kay? Uh, thanks. I just want to seek additional clarification from you, Mr. Chairman, just that what we're talking about, to make sure we're all on the same page, that when it comes to staff input, that staff will have the similar flexibility as with the um, consumer ombudsman to really shape and to provide feedback to the commission going forward. This will be a sort of a staff-driven process that comes up to us as opposed to us sitting in a room and hammering out all the details and then just telling staff what it is that they have to do. Uh, I don't see how we could do it any other way, to be quite honest. Uh, this has got to uh, really start with the foundation of staff input because, uh, as Commissioner Feldman saying, uh, we don't want to create new gaps and we don't want to have uh, conflicts or overlap uh, in uh, what's being addressed. And uh, hoverboards is one of those interesting examples because I wasn't thrilled with the Commission's response on hoverboards, and I'll just leave it at that. But 
No, no, uh, no, no. It's I, I understand the point you were making, and uh, you know, one thought off the top of my head would be, uh, if suddenly nanotechnology were emerging in the market, this would be the sort of thing where we would march over it and say, we need somebody who's expert in nanotechnology. And may I say, I particularly like the idea, as a former academic, of bringing in academics with their fresh thinking and their cutting edge research to help us uh, identify broad areas of concern. So. Uh, I, I fully support the notion of having staff sit down and taking a first cut at this uh, and making sure that they're satisfied before we move to uh, address and refine it. Great, and that would apply to the, the analytics office as well, just to save time. As far as I'm concerned, I feel that uh, uh, most, if not all, of this conversation is duplicative of the one that we're going to have about my amendment number nine. Exactly, so I'm just covering it now. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Let's hear it for efficiency. Are there additional comments or questions? I do, just, yes, just quickly. Um, so as I, I hear you describing these positions, I, I, I see them, or I'm hearing that, for, like today, we had a lot of amendments on technology and modernization, that um, these technology people would expand on that and uh, expand on our capabilities um, that we're not addressing right now. Yes, exactly. Okay, and you, you plan to um, uh, fill current vacancies that have already been accounted for in the resources? It's my hope that this would come from within an existing vacancy. Thank you. Well, it's going to have to, and we've already gotten a list of where we have vacancies, and so I'm leaving to our executive director the decision about where we would, uh, what position uh, that we would not fill and what new position this would be. Uh, are there additional comments and questions? If not, we will vote. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, the amendment is approved. Uh, you have additional amendments? I do. And I will hope to get through these uh, uh, in, in short order. Uh, but I appreciate everybody's patience today. Um, so my second amendment would uh, address the, well, why don't I, if it's okay with everybody, uh, why don't I go right to amendment number nine? Uh, because this conversation is is very similar to the one that we just had with 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 Feldman one I I apologize for going out of order. No, no, that sounds fine. I, that makes sense. Uh, so Feldman nine again is a, an amendment that would address agency modernization and it would support CPSC's mission to improve our understanding of large data sets and the safety insights that they potentially provide by hiring a chief data analytics officer. Um, the amendment would at the appropriate place insert uh, the following language that in fiscal 2020 the CPSC will continue its ongoing efforts to develop an agency-wide data management and analytics strategy to support the CPSC's mission and to allocate resources and one FTE in consultation with the commissioners and at the discretion of the executive director and without negatively impacting the agency safety mission for the purposes of, uh, of hiring a chief analytics officer. Um, I can talk with some more specificity about sort of my views about what the analytics officer's role would be. And again, uh, this is a position description that's aspirational. It's my hope that if uh, Feldman 9 is adopted, that, that, that uh, placing this in the ops plan would be a starting point for a more fulsome discussion. Uh, the chief analytics officer would be uh, CPSC's principal advisor on matters concerning data analysis. Uh, the purpose would be not to replicate functions and roles already in place at the agency, uh, but to be the agency's key advisor on uh, uh, advances in data analytics capabilities and best practices and understanding large data sets in support of our mission. The chief analytics officer would also assist the agency in terms of improving transparency uh, by facilitating better sharing of agency information uh, and agency data with uh, with, with outside stakeholders consistent with agency statutes. Um, this per individual would serve as the, uh, a again, a sufficiently senior uh, position within the, with, within the agency, structured um, in the org chart, very similar, if not identical, to where uh, the chief technologist uh, may sit. But again, those are specifics that I, I, I hope would be developed uh, balancing commission and staff input uh, to, 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 to make sure that uh, uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, th this, this is pursued in a way that doesn't sort of negatively impact uh, critical FTEs that are, that are currently vacant, to make sure that that's sort of a thoughtful and informed process, uh, and to make sure that, that the position description sort of developed with, uh, with as broad a consensus as we can find. 
Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to questions and comments. Um, I support this amendment also, although I do want to say uh, mine is a more cautious approval. <laughs> Uh, and actually, uh, when I had first seen it, I was, uh, I was not necessarily in support of it. Uh, I do greatly appreciate the collaboration between my office and Commissioner Feldman's office, including our staff sitting down and having extensive discussion uh, among the parties. Uh, I worry greatly in this case about overlap and redundancy, which is why picking up on the point that Commissioner Kay was making, this is one, as far as I'm concerned, that will require substantial and extensive staff input to make sure that whatever uh, position is filled in this regard, that it is a positive net plus for us, I mean, a net positive for us. And so uh, with that reservation, uh, I am supportive of the amendment. Uh, Commissioner, Be uh, I keep saying it. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions. So how would this work? Because both you and, and Acting Chair Adler raised the issue not to be, be duplicative of what we have here. Well, we have a epidemiology. We have, uh, of course, our whole epidemiology, but all the XHR taking in data and reviewing it and coming up with studies. How do you see this person interacting with what's already in place? Uh, EXHR is uh, an important vertical within the agency, but it's certainly not the only vertical within the agency that, that uses data and that has expressed at one point or another um, concerns about the volume of data that it's receiving and ability to sort of spot larger trends in a large data set. I think particularly as today we voted to accept uh, Commissioner Biacco's Fourth Amendment, um, expanding the sources of data inputs that, that, that the agency would consider, um, considering the volume of Section 15 reports that the agency sorts through, um, and, and uh, particularly as we've had discussions about expanding retailer reporting, uh, it seems uh, like an awkward thing to say in 2019 going into 2020 that it's just too much data, that we can't make sense of it. Um, I think given advances in artificial intelligence, um, given the, the state of the art that expect, exists with respect to data analytics uh, and the ability to derive really meaningful insights from large data sets, even if that's only for the purposes of figuring out what normal looks like in the marketplace so that we can better discern uh, sort of blips on the radar or the proverbial uh, smoke before the fire, um, I, I think that that's, that's a, 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 a good example of how this individual may uh, benefit and support EXHR's work in particular. But again, EXHR is not the only organization that, 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 that exists within CPSE that handles data. Uh, we have a database uh, in the form of uh, saferproducts.gov that we're all aware that there's complaints that that's not working particularly well. Uh, and uh, we held a, a hearing, I don't remember the exact date of it, but uh, those criticisms about that database not being a, as efficient as it possibly could be, uh, I think, or something that having a dedicated data scientist on staff would uh, go a long way in, in terms of uh, putting us on a better posture just to make the agency run better. There's other applications, but. So in the two instances you've, you've the two examples you've given, both with an influx of data that we can't seem to manage and or saferproducts.gov. My understanding has not been that we don't have the people to, to deal with that. It's, it's the technology we lack and the resources to get into place the technology so that we can have the capability to review data. Not that we lack the expertise, but, more ra but rather that we lack the technology and the ability to get that technology on board, and so I, I just I'm, I'm wondering how this person would interact with um, with what we have in place. And EXHR is where the data comes from. They look at saferproducts.gov. They look at Nice. They look at all of the data sources. And I, I'm concerned that this person. How, I don't know. I don't understand that relationship. I think you raise a really important point that there are potential tech solutions to the, the skills gap that, that, that we've identified and that we all understand to be true. Um, adopting an artificial intelligence or a machine learning uh, uh, 
capabilities through through a, a particular vendor one way or the other thing I think is a wonderful idea I think it's something that's reflected in the ops plan I think it's important that we have dedicated staff on 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 board at the agency that understands the technology itself and is able to to, to re refine its use to use it in, in the most efficient way possible and to make sure that uh, we are seeing all the critical safety signs that we need to in our market surveillance to make sure that we're not missing anything it's my fear that, that uh, you know, particularly as we're discussing an expansion of, of the data inputs that we're collecting, and I think that's a wonderful amendment that Commissioner Biacco uh, adopted that I think passed unanimously. Um, I think it's important that uh, in concert with that, that we supplement the agency's skills and, uh, and, and personnel, um, not to create more bureaucracy, not to replicate um, uh, ex existing roles. Uh, but to, to, to make sure that we're, we're doing this in the best, most thoughtful way possible. And I think a chief analytics officer would go a long way to putting us in as good a posture as we possibly could be, and that's why I introduced the amendment. Yeah, I would just emphasize I don't think we have a skills gap as much as we have a funding gap. And I think if we had the appropriate amount of resources to put into place and to be able to invest in AI and invest in the technology we need, we could accommodate the, the data, whether it's from retailer reporting or any other source. Um, but I appreciate your work on this amendment. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Uh, consistent with the conversation we had earlier about staff maintaining, having maximum flexibility and playing a leadership role, um, I support this amendment. Thank you. Commissioner Biacco? I actually think that the discussion here um, uh, further uh, supports um, at least some of my initiatives and why this person or why a chief analytical um, person is so essential here. During uh, many of the amendments that I presented today, we had questions about, well, you know, what, what we did this before, what can we do now? I, I think that is exactly the question. We need somebody to come in and say, here's what you can do. Somebody who knows and is, is very experienced and in and, and, and timely um, approaches and timely options to say, hey, you know, um, you guys have been doing this a long time and you've been doing it well and you've been doing it the same way. How about consider this and this will get you to this point and, and to that point. And I, I think that's exactly what we need and I think uh, this type of person is consistent with the amendments that I presented today that were designed to expand on what we're doing. I think it's time for us to up our game here and that's just, you know, having personnel um, that supplements and uh, adds to the good work that we're already doing is um, there's no I don't see a downside to that I appreciate that um, can I reclaim some of your time yeah uh, just I, I want to relay an anecdote that I had in a, a, a it was a public meeting yesterday with consumer reports um, and, and it's sort of echoing a, another criticism that I've heard and this gets back to one of Amory's earlier uh, questions about sort of a applications here um, the specific gripe was that when we send staff to participate in the voluntary standards process um, that different staff interprets diff uh, 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 the, the same data inconsistently and and I think having somebody that comes with a strong analytics background to help standardize sort of what our insights are and, and what the, the correct way to look at a large data set uh, to, to, to be able to comprehend any insights that might be gleaned, I think that standardization function would, 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 would benefit that area as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, additional comment? I just wanted to comment on that because I think it, it's an important point. Of course people are going to interpret data differently. That's Otherwise we'd all be sitting up here agreeing that Here's the next five things we need to do. It's just we look at things, whether it's a discipline or a person or a scientist or an academic, you look at things differently and you interpret things differently, uh, as, as evidenced by our OFR uh, conversation earlier today. So um, you, I don't think you can have one person who who reflects, I'll say, an interpretation of, 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 of our data because that person isn't speaking for the commission. I mean, it gets, it's just very tricky. I'm not opposed to this, but it's just so important. And I keep hearing substantial staff input, rely on staff expertise. Well, we've got some other amendments that disregard staff's opinion, which concerns me greatly. So, um, you know, I, I do think it's important that staff is involved because what we don't want to do is have an organization where 
we're siloed where we've got this person coming in who isn't working in concert with uh, EXHR and making sure that EXHR is helping them and then it's a good symbiotic relationship. So I'll stop there, but I just, there's I, a I, lot of, a lot of, of uh, important points and issues that need to be ironed out with this. I think you raised some very good points. I'm glad that you did. Um, I, I think if I may sort of paraphrase the, the, the nub of, of what you said at the outset, uh, that reasonable minds may differ with respect to the facts that they're, they're, they're presented in, in a data set. Um, I think that to the extent where we as a commission can strive for um, consistency in our messaging, uh, I, I think this would go a long way. And I think, I think the, the, the specific value add that a chief analytics officer would be to, to help develop a, a consistent method of analysis that, that would help us get to a better place with respect to, um, you know, differing and potentially conflicting uh, uh, messaging. And I'm not calling out anything specific, but there's always the potential that, uh, that, that in, the, in the possibility that we can be clearer. Just about, I have one additional question. So based on what you just said, um, does that mean then would there be a vote on what this person, if they're interpreting data, would the commission then look at it and make an agreement or make it an assessment about whether or not they agree and then that's the position we put forward? Again, uh, there's just a lot of details that I would no, have um, concerns I, I, with. I, I think the specific answer is no. Um, I think that, that the value out of, uh, of, of this role and, and this individual would be that uh, to the extent that we can help identify a consistent method of analysis, um, you know, that may result in consistent messaging. It may not. It may be a situation like we were talking about where reasonable minds disagree and see things differently. Um, but I think it puts us in a, a, a better posture than we currently are, which is why I think this amendment's a good one. Additional comments or questions? If not, then uh, we will take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. The amendment is unanimously agreed to. Uh, additional amendments from Commissioner Feldman? Uh, I, do I, I do have a few more. Um, uh, and uh, again, I hope to get through these quickly. Uh, Feldman 2 uh, is uh, an amendment with respect to the IoT working group. Um, it would continue the, the coordination that, that uh, Chairman Burkle began. Uh, with our sister agencies on potential safety issues related to IoT. Um, specifically, it would uh, insert on page 12 under the heading FY 2020 priority activities. Um, it would amend bullet three in that list to, uh, to read that the agency focus on potential safety issues with the Internet of Things and connected products through continued involvement with the multi-federal agency working group. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. We'll now turn to questions and comments. Um, I support this amendment and the continuing encouragement of staff to stay involved in the multi-federal agency working group. Uh, I particularly appreciate Commissioner Feldman's amendment, but I also want to note the excellent work that has been done by Commissioner Kay and his staff in developing a comprehensive, very, very persuasive approach to best practices in dealing with the Internet of Things. So that's a great foundation from which to start. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you. Uh, I too want to, uh, I will support this amendment. I do want to commend our staff, partic uh, particularly uh, Patty Adair, who took a lead. And we're not just participating in the intergovernment agency work, we have been a leader in that work for a small agency uh, with limited resources. Um, Ms. Adair has done an outstanding job in leading all of the efforts, and so I am very glad to see we'll be voting on continuing those uh, initiatives. And thank you for the shout out to Patty Adair. I am embarrassed that I didn't do that as well. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, so the, your amendment would strike the third bullet on page 12, correct, under FY 2020 priority? It would, it would alter. And, it wouldn't strike it. it would and strike substitute in, in your language? Yes, sir. So is it intent? So currently in the staff draft, bullet three reads as follows. Continue focus on potential safety issues with Internet of Things slash connected products by developing a best practices guidelines. So is it, it is your intent to strike the staff work associated with developing the guidelines? I want to know more about the guidelines. I think this amend, uh, amendment would not preclude that work. Um, I don't know what those best practice guidelines would look like. I imagine that they would look very similar to a white paper that, that you worked on. 
um, I, I, I think I think it would be uh, important to solicit additional input um, and to have a, a more deliberative process at, at the agency so that the commission um, can express its views on exactly what those best guidelines look like. Um, but but that's that's my thoughts and the intent of the amendment. Got it. Okay, so I think it's fantastic that. Uh, Dr. Midgen in my office took the lead and drafted what is now almost a year old best practices, but I don't, I'm not comfortable with that being the current word of the agency, so to speak. I'd much rather staff and the agency speak. And so if you were adding a bullet to continue work with the working group, I'd be totally supportive of that, but I'm not supportive of taking away the staff's work on best practices because if they're ready to do it then and, and I think it can certainly be done in the type of process you're talking about but if they're ready to do it I don't know why we would hold them back so unfortunately I can't support it as I any. understand additional comments and questions Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Come uh, I, um, I support this amendment. I think it's consistent with um, the uh, initiatives I have, and it, com they, it complements many of the amendments that I put forward today and that were adopted. So um, you have my vote on this. Forgot to call on you. I apologize. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, any addition? <laughs> no, that's not true. I just have one other um, comment to make with regards to this. I do believe uh, that NIST along with uh, our staff's help in all of the intergovernment ag agencies has just recently published IOT best practices, but I'd have to ch be sure of that, but I am fairly sure that uh, the work that we've done and have continued to do, and I see Dwayne Boniface nodding, I, I think that that is correct. NIST has published uh, best practices with the Internet of Things, so this has been taken to a higher level with the input of our staff, I believe. Thank you, additional comments and questions? I didn't want to have to say something, but I guess I, without having seen the NIST guidance, my concern, and there were a number of best practices that had been considered when Dr. Midget undertook his work, the issue was they weren't specific to our issues. And that's my concern. If it turns out that NIST has completely covered the field, and I'd be surprised because I don't know why staff would have this in here if that were the case, but if that's the case, fantastic. Uh, but I still hope that we would not lose sight of staff providing some work product in this area. Thank you. Additional comments, questions? I know she didn't mean it this way, but I don't consider NIST to be the higher level. I figure that they're an agency on par with CPSC. All I said was they published findings with, the, with their part of the intergovernment agency group. And to uh, Commissioner Kay's point, his document is not the only document out there. There's a lot of work being done here and our staff has been a very vital part of it. I do seem to recall when we had the hearing on the Internet of Things, there were a number of groups that walked in with best practices, so uh, there are lots of best practices, uh, and so um, uh, I hope the staff continues its work on best practices. Additional comments and questions? If not, we'll call a vote. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay? No. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. The votes are four to one. The amendment passes. Commissioner Feldman, additional amendments, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Feldman three is an amendment uh, addressing emerging hazards. Um, it would improve staff's ability to participate in the standards development process for emerging technologies, including on connected products, wearables, 3D printing, and others. Um, it's a simple amendment on page 14 uh, in, in the bullet under the paragraph titled 133 Two seven emerging hazards. Uh, it would be amended by inserting the words as directed by the commission after including work on voluntary standards development. One of the criticisms uh, and concerns that I've heard is that when our staff is deployed to participate in standards development organizations, they do not always feel empowered uh, to, to speak on, on behalf of the commission or, or to offer uh, views that carry as much weight as if it was directed by the commission. Um, and therefore, I think this is a, an, an amendment that would uh, Im improve the, the ability of, uh, of, of, of the commission to operate in, in consultation with, uh, with, with staff and to have a little bit more input on, on, uh, on, on the SDO process that's contemplated in the current, in the current op plan. Um, is there a second? Second. 
Thank you. Uh, then we turn to questions and comments. Uh, I intend to support this uh, amendment. Um, I don't believe that it calls for a mandatory commission approval of voluntary standards amendments. I think what you're saying is to the extent the commission can add its voice uh, to voluntary standards amendments, that will help, and I fully agree with that. So I am supportive of that. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, questions or comments? Thank you. Um, I guess um, my first question would be, how would this work? Standards development organizations are just that. They're making uh, the sausage um, process. So we're going to send our staff in after consultation with the commission with a position, and that's their position. I, I don't understand how this is going to be, how, how this would ever work. Um, it, it, it would work in that it, it would provide an opportunity for uh, some oversight and input by the commission uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, to spell out with some better specificity what the agency's position is specifically with respect to um, the emerging hazards that are contemplated in the, in the current operating plan under, um, under uh, item 13327. Um, what, what, it, what it would do is uh, make sure, uh, hearkening back to the conversation that we were just having, uh, make sure that particularly where there are um, you know, various competing best practices and guidance documents that exist among uh, uh, different federal agencies, uh, different industry groups um, that, that our messaging be as consistent and clear as it possibly can. And uh, I, I think whenever there's an opportunity to uh, better involve the commission in these kinds of decision-making uh, positions and, and direction setting, that's a good thing. That's why I introduced the amendment and that's why I hope you'll support it. So, Again, we're talking about standards development, and these standard development committees work countless hours trying to figure it out based on data we provide and based on input that we have, but it is a consensus standard. And so that is the nature, that's what our statute requires, a consensus standard. And so for us to go in there with a pre dis, I'll say predetermined position I just I can't understand how this would work I mean if we take tip overs or we take just pick one voluntary standards committee and just maybe run through how this would work how we would let staff know and what if for instance and we saw this very clearly here with uh, with the ops plan our disagreements and agreements and discussions what if three commissioners favor one position and two commissioners favor another? How does that staff person go in there and reconcile that position to the standards body, to the standard body's organization? I mean, I just, I don't understand how this could work. Um, may I ask that you yield to me for just a few seconds? Yes, sir. Um, I actually think this is a good idea, and I think we've done it on numerous occasions, and I would cite tip overs, uh, I would cite window coverings, and I would cite ROVs as instances in which the commission sent a strong consensus to standards development bodies and said, this is what we're looking for. Now, they're, they're free to reject that, but I think that's a perfectly appropriate, if not commendable, approach for this commission to take. But that's a very different position than saying to staff, this must be your position, versus sending a message to the entire body. And uh, so I, I don't understand how that could work. Why do we empower our standards of development or officer? Why do we empower, we just hired a deputy because you wanted the standards development group and that to, to, to uh, continue their good work and to make sure that they had, that uh, Patty Edwards, who does a great job, that she has what she needs. And now we're gonna take back some of the, the authority and the ability for staff to apply their expertise, not our expertise. We have the ability, the statute says, if a voluntary standard and a consensus standard addresses the hazard and there's substantial compliance, then we don't have any recourse. However, we can, we always can, can always start mandatory rulemaking. So I think this is not a good thing. I, I, I don't understand the consistency, the inconsistencies when it comes to staff. I just heard for two positions, we're gonna get the expertise from staff, we're gonna work with staff, make sure we have what they need. And now we're saying, staff, sorry, you have to 
take the you have to adopt the commission's position and go back and you have to whether you believe it or not whether you're a scientist whether you're an expert on whatever it is tech data you're looking for you have to do what we're telling you to do i think that is nonsensical i'm going to permit Commissioner Feldman to respond. I do have some personal responses. I, I, I don't view the uh, I, I don't view the two as inconsistent. Um, again, without telling Commissioner Feldman what his amendment is, I can tell you how I interpret it. Uh, I don't think this is taking back authority from the commission. I think what this is doing is enhancing the authority of the staff when they go to participate in a voluntary standards proceeding. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when they're reaching a consensus, that means the consensus from stakeholders. I think the commission is a worthy stakeholder. So I, I, the more I think about it, the more supportive of it I am. But we may just have a different understanding of what standards, the voluntary standards process is about. Uh, additional comments, Commissioner K. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I can only just obviously speak for myself to address Commissioner Burkle's concerns with the perceived inconsistency. At least the way I look at it is that if it's a policy call by the commission, we take into consideration staff's technical expertise. We take into consideration outside expertise, comments, what have you. But ultimately, we're charged with making that policy call. And sometimes we agree with staff's policy recommendations. Sometimes we don't. On the hiring issue, I think that's totally different because there are areas of human resource issues, as I mentioned, facilities issues, legal obligations, things there's no way we would ever have the insight into. And I wouldn't want to create an issue without letting staff lead that effort and help enlighten us as to what all of those uh, concerns are. And they go well beyond that. They go into very legitimate issues of people's feeling of their own turf and how people have to work together. And I think that it's unfair for staff when it primarily affects their workspaces and their working arrangements to not take into consideration their views. That's just how I distinguish the two. I support the amendment. Thank you. Additional comments or questions? If not, then again. A big part. Uh, I'm <laughs> I want to get a complex up here. <laughs> Sorry about I'm that. Get a buzzer. Uh, you can get a fly swatter or a stick. Either <laughs> one will work. Sorry, I apologize. That's okay. I'm so quiet over here. Um, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I'm conflicted on this one. I, I don't know how to vote on this one, and I'll tell you why. Um, on one hand, I support the opportunity to involve the commission more. I think the commission, I certainly want to be more involved and more hands-on. I think all of us bring something to the table and a, a perspective. Um, I have the same concerns that uh, Commissioner Burkle does. I, I, I can't picture how this would work. And I, I, I'm sitting here trying to come up with ways what I see, and, and here's, here's Here's where I am. So I, I've been a, a, a longtime proponent of, um, I, I don't like how long voluntary standards take. And so I've been a, a proponent of, look, if you can't come up with a voluntary standard that works, we're going to help you out here. The problem is the way we approach it right now, um, we don't have a position before the voluntary standard. We wait for it to fail and that takes a long time and the consumers suffer before we come up with the, the mandatory rulemaking going forward. So it would be great to have a participant at a voluntary standards um, or a meeting saying, look, you guys better come up with something because if you don't, this is where the commission's prepared to go. I think that could speed things up and I see that as a positive thing. On the other hand, I can see um, the commission's position and direction to interfere with a consensus standard that might otherwise be reached. So it's the voluntary standards development part that I'm struggling with. Um, can you help me out on this one? Uh, I don't believe that the direction that the commission provides necessarily needs to be particularly prescriptive one way or the other or outcome determinative. The, the, the direction may be, and keep in mind that this is limited to uh, a, a number of specific potential standards development um, activities with respect to emerging hazards. Um, it's important to look at this amendment in, in the specific context that it, that it exists within the, the text as it's been presented for us for consideration. Um, the, 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 the direction could be uh, to, to, just, just to the extent that the commission is a, a approving participation on a particular 
uh, emerging hazard or identifying an emerging hazard that may not uh, that, that that may not particularly be receiving sufficient attention from staff and and sort of directing staff to go ahead and participate do we and need not this and not handcuffing staff one way or the other do we need this language to do that I, I don't think we necessarily uh, this language is useful to that extent in that it, it's another touch point that the seventh floor has in terms of providing input and direction to the activities of staff with respect to uh, voluntary SDOs. How does this square with, I mean, I, I've sat in on some of the calls and, and have spoken up and my staff's like, no, no. How does that square with commissioners not participating? I don't think this would apply to commissioners. This would apply to staff's participation. But if we, if we give, if we direct, if the commission directs the staff, isn't that just a proxy for us participating? I, I wasn't aware that there was a prohibition on commissioner participation. There and, and yeah, there is. Okay. Uh, but okay, I mean, I'm just, like I said, I'm conflicted. I, I do want to put in language that gets the commission more involved. I think we need to be more involved, and I do think, I agree with you, I hear this all the time, that they feel, uh, staff often feels um, that they, they're not empowered and they don't know what to do. Um, and giving them more direction, I think, is really important. I, I'm just not sure this is the, it, this does it. I'm just not sure. Okay. Um, if I might, uh, I would refer folks to the Commission's uh, regulation on participation in voluntary standards, and I'm looking at 1031.15, which specifically contemplates staff participating in uh, and communicating Commission positions on technical matters that are substantive in nature. Uh, there's some restrictions on how they do it without appropriate authority within their group, but that does contemplate that the Commission would do that. And I must also say that we have a provision in our statute that I hate uh, that requires us before we can issue a mandatory standard to examine the world of voluntary standards and <clears throat> if we determine there's one that is adequate and is substantially complied with, we must rely on that and we cannot write a safety standard to say that we should have a hands-off approach under those conditions to me uh, is really uh, limiting and tying the Commission's hands. So again, the more I think about it, the stronger I feel in support of it. Uh, Additional comments? Uh, I, I don't think anyone is suggesting a hands-off approach. Um, I, I think this is a complete juxtaposition with the authority we gave staff a few years back to be able to vote and take a leadership position. I don't know how we reconcile that in this. And on uh, Commissioner Feldman's Ninth Amendment, we just approved a chief analytics officer. Maybe that's the person that needs to be interacting with staff and helping them with uh, the voluntary standards development. That person is going to be charged with looking over the horizon and identifying emerging hazards. This body is not equipped to do that. That's why we're saying here we need uh, this, this analytics, this chief analytics officer. I, I, you know, what we get into with the commission is policy. What the staff is involved with in the development of voluntary standards has to do with data and the information we get through all of our sources of data. That's how the staff operates. It's up to the commission after they do what they're going to do to talk to them about policy. We get a V-STAR report quarterly that lays out if, if the commission looks at that V-STAR report, it is, it's a document that thick from Patty Edwards. Here's what the staff's doing on this. We don't like what they're doing. We, you know, we met quarterly with Patty Edwards to hear what the voluntary standards coordinator had to say, what staff was doing. Every time we get a uh, public calendar, it's, it's in there, what staff is doing, how they're, the, you know, how they're working with the voluntary standards. There's all sorts of way for us to be involved and to be paying attention, and we certainly should be. But I think at that level, it's not a policy question in the voluntary standards organization. At this level, it is policy. At that level, it's data and the interpretation of data. Additional comments or questions? If not, then uh, we will vote. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote on this? No. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Biacco? Um, 
think I'm going to I'm going to go with it and see how it works. I think it still will be limited to the boundaries of the voluntary standards rule um, in uh, 16 CFR 1031. I would like to see the commission get more involved because I, I didn't have the benefit other than seeing the public calendar or what was going on. So let's see how it works. And if it's not working, I would rely on my colleagues and myself to step up and say this isn't working and we're go not going to do it. But let's give it a try. I'm going to air on that side, yes. We'll take that as a yes I'm sorry. with an explanation, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner you, Feldman. I vote yes. And I vote yes, uh, so that is uh, four yes and one no. The uh, amendment passes. Additional amendments, Commissioner Feldman? Um, Feldman four is another burden reduction amendment, and uh, keeping in mind that we just passed earlier uh, Commissioner Biacco's seventh amendment, um, I, I've made some slight amendments uh, modifications to my amendment to make sure that they're consistent. Um, so uh, this amendment would provide for a more robust burden reduction than is currently called for in the, in the op plan. Um, it reads that on page 18, uh, the burden reduction paragraph is further amendment, amended to read as follows, that this project provides funding for ongoing efforts towards potentially providing meaningful reduction of third-party testing costs of children's products, among other things. Um, and then striking the first sentence, um, uh, the, it, it would further read, also, CPSC staff will review comments received, including but not limited to comments received in response to the June 16, 2017 RFI on potentially reducing uh, regulatory burdens without harming consumers and develop re recommendations for uh, commission consideration. So uh, this is a, a, a narrow, light touch amendment that opens the door uh, for, for agency consideration of, of additional burden reduction items without specifying them, um, it would be consistent within uh, the, the the allocations that are that are associated with uh, with, with the op plan as it's currently existed. Um, but it would provide some additional flexibility for the agency uh, to address something here or there should it come up uh, during the course of the operating plan being in effect. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. We'll now turn to questions and comments. Um, I. Uh, I'm going to reluctantly oppose this if it were simply the first uh, sentence that says that we will provide a briefing package with final recommendations for p potential determinations of manufactured fibers. That's on page nine of the, I'm sorry? Sorry, I was talking to Oh, Scott. okay. Uh, if, th this is absolutely consistent with what's already in the op plan, so I don't really see a need for that, but that I wouldn't oppose. It's this additional work where I don't know quite what the resources to be dedicated to it are, and because I don't know what those additional uh, resources would be, I'm going to oppose it. Commissioner uh, Burkle. I have no questions. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Commissioner Feldman, I just want to make sure I heard you right. I think you said that when you said it's a light touch, that it would, your intent is not to require any additional staff months taken from anywhere else. Did I understand that correctly? That's correct. Okay, because my understanding, and I hate to pull Mr. Ray back up here, but when we asked this question yesterday of staff, the answer we received was that it would take three to five additional staff months. So I would need to reconcile those two, because obviously that's a that's an important difference in allocation. I understand that concern. I think it's difficult to state with specificity, specificity exactly what the staff allocation would be because it doesn't specifically call out any particular burden reduction activity. Um, I, I think that staff has has uh, already reviewed the comments that are um, associated with, uh, with that 2017 RFI, uh, but this would put that uh, in, in, in play should um, should there be additional recommendations for consideration, but it would also open the door um, w within the universe of, uh, of burden reduction opportunities that the commission might consider during the during the op plan. So I guess we're sort of back where we were before with the different amendment. If if you're willing to have language in here reflect that there's it would not require additional staff time than what staff's already dedicating to this particular line, then I'm fine with it because it's for, it's. Uh, resource neutral, but if staff believes that this definitively as written develop recommendations for commission consideration in particular uh, cannot be um, resource neutral, then I unfortunately cannot support it. Additional questions, comments? I, I'm comfortable if you've got language that you'd like to add to this that makes this resource neutral, consistent with what we did on Biaco 7. Uh, I'm 
Commissioner Bianco, additional comments, questions? Uh, I would not view this as being consistent with the Commissioner Bianco Amendment 7. If we were to conform it to what uh, Commissioner Kay is calling for, uh, I'd be supportive of it, but to the extent that it would require additional resources, I'm opposed to it. So uh, I think we'd have to have some clear understanding that this must stay within existing resources. So, uh, I mean, I guess, sorry, may I proceed? Yes, please. Uh, I would then suggest as a friendly amendment, I guess, that at the end it would say, after develop recommendations for commission consideration, comma, within uh, existing planned resources for this project. If, if the rest of the, if a majority of, of uh, the commissioners support that language, then I'm comfortable with it. So it would, I don't, I, I, I would, perhaps the, 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 the best way to proceed would be to take a vote on your friendly amendment. Uh, if that passes, uh, we'll vote on the underlying amendment as amended. If it doesn't pass, we'll rely on the, We'll, we'll, we'll take an underlying vote on the language as introduced. May I just see clarification from Mr. Ray that if we made that change that it would be understood that they would not have to provide any additional resources? I'm, I'm not fully tracking on that. I can just say this. We did not plan to do this activity, so we don't have planned resources currently in what we put With before. anything associated with this? With those activities that are prescribed here. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Would you yield for a second? Absolutely. Um, I'm looking at page nine, which says uh, burden reduction, burden reduction manufactured fibers. That's already in the op plan, and it's, so if we were to say uh, a briefing package with final rule recommendations for potential determinations for manufactured fibers, and the rest of it is encompassed within existing resources, uh, then I think I would be supportive, but are you saying that we've dedicated all the resources that might be dedicated to this for the manufactured fibers package? Anything above that in terms of reviewing comments received would require additional resources not programmed? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Then I would withdraw um, my attempt to cure it and unfortunately have to stay opposed, but I appreciate the consideration, Commissioner Feldman, and thank, thank you, you, Mr. Ray. And I also express my appreciation. That's one of the things that I appreciate the commission uh, doing today is being so flexible and open-minded, and I think that's a great example. Uh, with that, are there additional questions or comments? If not, then we'll vote. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Kay? No. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote no. Uh, there are three yeses. It passes. Commissioner Feldman, do you have additional amendments? Yes, I do. Um, Feldman 5 is, uh, again, a relatively straightforward uh, amendment that I believe is uh, uh, consistent with where the agency currently is with respect to CNPPA enforcement. Um, but the amendment would prioritize enforcement of the Child Nicotine Poison Prevention Act. Um, as drafted, it emphasizes the removal of noncompliant product in the marketplace, um, consistent with the congressional intent behind the statute. Um, it would not, however, in my view, preclude the agency from conducting a consumer level recall if necessary. Um, the amendment uh, would, on page 22, under the paragraph about uh, 2020 priority activities, insert the following language that it's a priority to, quote, enforce the Child Nicotine Poison Prevention Act, including removal of noncompliant liquid nicotine containers from commerce. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay, need to. Second. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Questions or comments? I have no questions or comments. I intend to support the amendment and appreciate Commissioner Feldman's very, very hard work and dedicated approach to this. Commissioner Feldman, I just have a question you mentioned at the end um, with regards to including removal of noncompliant liquid nicotine from consumers? From commerce. From commerce. And so you didn't, and so how, what does that mean? I mean, more than what we're doing right now? Uh, it, it would be my intent that, that this places an emphasis on uh, the compliance activities to focus in crafting corrective action plans, that it, it focus on uh, actually removing the product from, from commerce. Now, I, I could drill down on that a little bit more to, to cure, I think, with the, the issue that you're getting at. Um, it's possible, and we've seen situations where uh, a, a, a potential remedy is to modify existing product to, to, to come into compliance. 
particularly when we're talking about situations where it's the, 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 the specific incidence of noncompliance is failure to adhere with the flow restrictor requirements where you could retroactively put a flow restrictor into, into the product. As I read that, and it's maybe a subtle or legal point, um, the act of, of modifying the product would therefore make it not noncompliant and therefore uh, would, uh, would, 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 wouldn't be the subject of, of, of the, the kinds of things. It, it, it would have, been, in fact, either make it noncompliant or uh, uh, effectively uh, remove a noncompliant uh, product from, 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 from commerce. Or would make it compliant. Yes. Can you it's been a long day. Commissioner Merkel, please. So, so you're just talking about continuing what we're doing. That has been a priority. We've got, I think, compliance did an extraordinary uh, job of, of putting together a compliance plan. Uh, I know that some files have already been referred to general counsels and working on that. I, so I'm not sure, other than just a statement saying this is important work and we're going to continue doing it as an agency. Well, it hasn't always been a priority, but I think we've made, under your leadership, some important strides forward. Uh, I think including this as a priority activity in 2020 would um, would be an important safeguard to continue the, the, the forward progress that we've made thus far. No other questions. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so there could be daylight between what you said, um, removal of noncompliant liquid nicotine containers from commerce, including consumer level recall, which I think you said, mm -hmm and doing what we're doing now. Just so I understand, you just are basically saying all of our, we, all of our normal remedies for recalls are on the table. Yes, sir. No more, no less. Okay, that, if that's the intent, then I'm comfortable with this. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? <laughs> no, I actually looked at her and she shook her head, so uh, it was all unspoken, but it was very strong communication. But thank you for record, that. Record, Bob, for yes. the record. No, no, for the record. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, hearing no additional questions or comments in particular, especially from Commissioner Biacco, uh, can we move to a vote? Uh, I now call for the vote. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Biacco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. The motion is unanimously carried. Commissioner Feldman, do you have additional amendments? Feldman 6 is a, uh, an amendment dealing with the Office of Compliance re Organization. Um, the purpose of the amendment would be to restore the children's product defect team within the Office of Compliance. Uh, there's currently a perception that the agency is not doing enough in terms of enforcement efforts with respect to children product defects. Uh, we've been criticized in the media on this front and by, con and by Congress uh, for the decision to disband this team. I'll admit I don't fully understand the decision to disband this team, um, and I'm aware that staff opposes the amendment. Um, but again, I don't claim to understand that I fully understand the rationale uh, but behind the decision. The purpose of the amendment as it's drafted would uh, be to layer some additional, wouldn't be to layer additional bureaucracy within uh, the Office of Compliance, uh, but to add some additional clarity and accountability to the process by making sure that we have a team that's dedicated to uh, th this type of, of, of compliance and enforcement um, that's identified, known, and understood. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to consideration of the amendment. Um, as a first point, I want to mention that this is not a, an amendment that the staff supports. The staff uh, is concerned that this will send the wrong signal in terms of how the staff uh, in compliance is organized. Uh, I am absolutely sensitive to the concerns that staff has raised. Uh, the reason that I am cautiously and reluctantly supporting this is that I do think it's a good idea to send a strong signal to the world that CPSC's concern for children, uh, in particular getting dangerous toys out of the market, remains strong. Uh, I also note that this is asking staff to send us a plan uh, for consideration. Uh, it may be when I see the plan, I will decide that uh, this is uh, ill-advised and I may oppose it, but I do think that uh, Commissioner Feldman makes a very good point in terms of what the signal is that we send to our stakeholders and to the public at large. So very cautiously, I would support this. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you. Um, I guess my first question is, 
since when does this agency organize, act, react to perception and to criticism? That is not what we do. We are a data-driven agency and we look at our priorities, what we're doing here today, we're establishing our priorities. Just because someone in the media criticized, do they even know what the whole compliance reorg entailed? Do they even know that a lot of thought, not under my leadership, it began under when, when Commissioner Kay was chairman, the organ, reorganization began and it continued on. This is staff, we hire staff, we hire a compliance director who we rely on to look at the organization within compliance and to say to us, this isn't working, I need to reorganize. And it was done with a tremendous amount of thought and input and working with uh, the executive director's office and uh, Mr. Ray who is uh, in, oversees uh, compliance and for us to just say, nope, there was something critical of that in the newspaper, so we're gonna change course. We'll be knee jerking around. <coughs> I, I just am dumbfounded that that would be the impetus for us to change. Who says we're not dealing with child defects? Where is that? Just because where it's not called the child defects unit, who, how does that even, how do you even wrap your head around the Consumer Products Safety Commission not tending to children's products? What was identified in the restructure was that we're going to look at it a different way and the way it was set up created uh, a lot of work. It was, an unstru it was not a good balance of work for the staff to do. The complete or reorganization of compliance was to modernize compliance and to help be, have it be more efficient. I just am adamantly opposed to this and it is the commission reaching down into staff and their expertise and again undermining when we, when we hire someone and the, the compliance director requires a commission vote, we are relying on them to, to put their best, their best foot forward and to give us their best recommendation for us how this agency is going to run and I just feel like I am a you know there was an article and it said you know given the child defects where who even was that someone in the agency who was maybe a little disgruntled who said that that is not and should not be the impetus for this organization and this body to act yeah respond please um, I, I, I agree that CPSC is an agency driven organization at least it attempts to be uh, the, the intent and the justification behind the amendment isn't in response to any one particular piece of criticism, but rather uh, taking into account that that criticism is indicative of what I believe to be a larger perception um, that we're not doing enough in terms of enforcement on uh, children's products defects. I think, I think that this amendment would go a long way to underscoring our commitment to, uh, to, 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 to that as a specific and important class of products. I think that we all agree that the, the defects involving fatalities warrant the highest level of agency attention and as a subset of those, uh, those, those, those defects involving child fatalities uh, rise perhaps even, even, even more to the top of, uh, of, of, of where we should be placing our priorities, although not exclusively. Um, I think that this is a good amendment, uh, amendment because it, 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 it signals and, and, and underscores our commitment here. I don't think it would be particularly disruptive to the way compliance currently operates, um, but that's why I introduced it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, additional questions or comments? Uh, I just, again, I want to just go back to um, number one, we have a regulatory side of the house and most children's products are strictly regulated and I think we've had a great deal amount of success in enforcing the statute and making sure children's products are compliant with those regulations and when they are not we deal with them. When there is a defect and I will say children we always talk about the most vulnerable uh, population and we pay the closest attention to that. The children's products have always been a priority for this agency but to, to question a reorganization that just occurred that hasn't even had a chance to play out in full. We haven't even completed the hiring to, to put this plan into action, into complete action. 
it just undermines any faith that we're supposed to have in staff. And I am vehemently opposed to this. I think it sends the very wrong message. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is not an amendment I would have offered. And um, I do understand both what Commissioner Feldman's getting at, and I also very much understand Commissioner Burkle's concerns. Um, it's a choice that I wish I did not have to make because I think that there are um, underlying areas for improvement that I think Commissioner Feldman's getting at that I think we could all agree on, and so this is not the way I would go about doing it. But if presented with the status quo or um, having an opportunity to continually seek improvement, which is I feel like what I'm being presented with here, I would um, very reluctantly vote for this amendment in the name of trying to seek improvement and hope that there is wiggle room going forward to try to unpack some of the areas that the commission might want to see continued improvement on and see if there's some flexibility to get there in a way that's uh, consistent with the way staff believes it should be organized. Um, Commissioner Bianco. I think one of the, I, I don't completely, I, I, I understand both sides as well. And um, I, I don't have the benefit of staff's position on this uh, in detail. Uh, I think part of the problem is the commission was not, uh, we did not vote on the re uh, reorganization. And so um, maybe some of these things could have been avoided if the commission had input at that time. Um, but. I think giving, given all the uh, projects that were mentioned today and, and, and um, added and so forth, I would choose to take the resources that would be used here to have a plan that might not go through e anyway um, and apply those resources um, to something, uh, something else. That's, it's not to say that I don't agree and I'm not sure like I said, how, how this came out, or if it, I'm not even convinced that it um, would help do any more than we're already doing, or it would. Um, I just don't know enough, and um, if my choice is to um, support a, a, another plan, when I'm hearing, well, we don't have the resource for this, and we don't have the resource for that, I think I'd like to relieve staff here and give them um, some breathing room, if you could call it that, to work on some of the other projects. So that would be the only reason I wouldn't support it. Uh, additional comments? Um, I just want to add that, uh, Commissioner Burkle, you make a very, very compelling case. Uh, you haven't convinced me to change my vote, but I promise that I will look with a great deal of concern uh, and caution on any plan that the staff would submit to us. Additional questions or comments? If not, we'll take a vote. I, I want to add to my comments, and that is all I'm asking this body to do is give the reorganization a chance. The organization, the reorg, has not even been fully implemented. And we're sitting here. How do we know it's not working? Because the Washington Post told us there's no nothing to substantiate that the, that the new structure isn't working. And we sit here and we just say, oh, well, someone said that, so we're going to believe it, and rather than relying on staff. Give this, give this reorg a chance. Give this reorg an opportunity to be fully implemented, that compliance gets fully up to staff. I know you've got concerns because of the numbers of staff. Give it a chance to play out. And given this, this amendment, I'm sure there will be uh, I don't even have to say this because I know staff puts children's products and the defects at the top of their priority list. This is, I find this insulting to staff and the, it's just premature. It's premature because the, the plan hasn't been fully implemented and I th I, I'm imploring my colleagues, give this reorg a chance before you deem it unsuccessful. And in a year from now or six months from now, Revisit it, but in the meantime, don't disrupt a plan that even it hasn't even been given a chance. I find that just so troubling. May I be heard? Yes. Hearing those concerns and criticisms, uh, I, I think I'm going to withdraw the amendment. I appreciate that very much. Uh, and uh, I think we all appreciate the openness. And I think for those who are watching and think that everything's cast in concrete when we come to meetings, the fact is that people listen to one another and they are moved by 
uh, strong, powerful arguments, I think, is really commendable. Uh, I would just add that I do think that uh, it's important to work with the Office of Compliance, and that's one of the big priority areas I have for moving forward is that we do a very careful look at compliance, in particular the resources that we dedicate to compliance. So uh, appreciate uh, Commissioner Feldman doing that, and do you have additional amendments? I do. Feldman 7 uh, is a, an amendment that deals with e-commerce modernization. Uh, the amendment would implement a number of staff's proposals that are currently in the operating plan with respect to e-commerce and the import surveillance that uh, Mr. Jaholski's team is currently conducted. Uh, it's a uh, more narrowly targeted amendment that on page 28 under the FY2020 priority activities that bullet six is amended to insert uh, the language and proposed to the commission for implementation after the word determine. Um, that's getting uh, at the, a number of the recommendations that the, uh, that the, the import surveillance team access is currently tasked with um, with making determinations about um, it would uh, it would make that more of an action item or oriented priority activity in terms of uh, contemplating a, a, a work product for Commission consideration uh, is there a second for that amendment second thank you uh, I have no questions or comments Commissioner Burkle I have no comments or questions I thank Commissioner Feldman for offering the amendment Commissioner Kay Thank you, Mr. Chair. I plan to support it, and I appreciate the refining it down to a more specific deliverable. I always think that's a better idea. Commissioner Biaco. Um, thank you as well, Commissioner Feldman. I do support this one. I think this is, goes along with a lot of the um, a lot of my initiatives. So thank you for presenting it. Okay. Uh, at this point, we will take a vote. Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay. Yes. Commissioner Biaco. Yes. And Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, the amendment is unanimously approved. Commissioner Feldman. Last but not least, Feldman 8 is an amendment dealing with the Office of Communications. Um, the amendment would improve commission oversight of the Office of Communications by requiring our communications team uh, to provide information, on the, uh, information to the commission to substantiate the safety claims of official agency communications. Um, on page 34, under the Office of Communications Priority Activities paragraph, it would insert at the appropriate place the following language that upon request by any commissioner, um, the Office of Communications provide timely updates to the commission, including information to support any safety claim made in OCM press releases, social media posts, safety campaigns, and other external communications. Thank you for that. Is there a second? Second. Uh, at this point, we will uh, consider it and ask questions. Um, the, th this one gives me pause. Uh, it, it makes me nervous, especially as it was originally proposed, but even as it's been revised. Uh, the one thing I don't want to do is have our communication staff paralyzed under a requirement for uh, incredible documentation. Uh, to me, this permits staff to say we talked to technical staff, and technical staff has said the following things, uh, and therefore that's a justification for issuing uh, communication uh, messages. Uh, I think this is a perfectly fine amendment in the sense that I, I find it hard to uh, remember any instances in which the Office of Communications did not have technical documentation when it uh, issued press releases or made social media posts. So to the extent this is a reminder uh, of the need to do that, I'm fine. Uh, I would be strongly opposed to this if this somehow required the Office of Communications to pause while a commissioner asked to review uh, whatever release there is going to be made. But it's certainly something that uh, it does call for uh, if a commissioner is concerned, to contact the Office of Communications and have explained to them what the documentation is behind the uh, issuance of a press release. Specifically on that point of whether it would require a pause, I don't believe that it would. That's why that the, the language is crafted specifically uh, to require OCM to provide, to provide timely updates. And I, I really appreciate that clarification. Commissioner Burkle? Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions, um, and I'm not sure it may be useful at some point to go through, before OCM, to go through the process OCM follows 
before a press release goes out, before a tweet goes out, before anything is done, that 6B clearance, that it, so many eyes are laid on that document and conversations and communication with EXHR, with EPI, with compliance, so that the information that's going out is not the opinion of OCM, but rather as close to the facts as we can get. And I think, uh, just practically speaking, if this were to pass, so let's, I don't know, just take an issue, the press release goes out and it alleges that there are so many um, incidents. Well, I would pick up the phone and I'd call EPI or I'd call EXHR or I probably would call Mr. Ray and say, how many, how many incidents, me as a commissioner trying to, to, to verify this? Well, that's what OCM does. The, 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 they're not going to put out anything that isn't cleared. Now, whether the commission agrees with it, the way they agree with how it is phrased, that's a different issue. But I just want to make it really clear that OCM does not act on their own. They act in concert with EXHR, with uh, specifically with EPI, but with, uh, I'm looking at Mr. Boniface, but all of the teams with compliance with the executive director and with general counsel to make sure when we utter a word out of this agency, it's appropriate and it isn't a violation of 6B and it's as accurate as it can be. So uh, I just, I don't even understand what the purpose of this is other than to get the background information which we could pick up the phone ourselves and call or I, I would guess it will be available. But I'm very glad to hear that it will not hold up the dissemination of information because, and that's, I just want to clarify that point because otherwise nothing will go out. It would not and uh, to tie it back to the conversation that we started today off having about OFRs, um, on, on your amendment we had a, a fairly in-depth discussion about the importance that uh, the information that the agency communicates be accurate. Um, the agency credibility is such a fragile thing that I think this amendment um, helps create some additional safeguards to make sure that the, the safety claims that we are communicating to the public, in fact, are, are accurate and substantiated. I, I don't disagree with that, but the problem is the Commission doesn't have that information. We have to reach out to the very people who are informing OCM and providing them with the information. Again, we may not agree with it, um, but but the information that he, that OCM is putting out is consistent with what EXHR, with epidemiology, with compliance, whether it's incidents or anything else. Um, and so I, I, I just don't understand. We don't have that expertise. We will rely on staff, and that's exactly what OCM does. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My understanding is that that's really all Commissioner Feldman's asking is just to have access to the information and to whoever had come up with whatever the justification is to provide that, uh, not before it goes out, but at some point just to inform any individual commissioner what the basis is for any recommendation. Um, to Commissioner Burkle's point, it shouldn't be an issue because the work is already happening in many instances, and so I don't know why it would cause any more work uh, than if even without this amendment and you picked up the phone and you said, hey, I noticed you suggested in a recent tweet that on product X, the proper way to handle it is to do the following steps. Where do we get that from? They should be able to answer any commissioner's request. And so all this is doing is putting in writing what I think should already be a practice that uh, should be followed. I do appreciate, Commissioner Feldman, your flexibility in working with my office to modify the language a little bit to make sure there's that flexibility and that there is not a belief on staff's part that they have to um, draft an entire white paper to provide that information. So I plan to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? If Maybe. not, oh, I'm. Oh my God. <laughs> you wore your invisible suit today. I'm uh, telling no. you. Bob, you're starting to worry me. Uh, I think it's giving us both a complex and <laughs> it's me a bigger one, so I humbly apologize. Thank you. I actually think this is a much needed amendment. Um, the commission, or uh, the communications department speaks on behalf of the agency and not on behalf of the um, communications department. And I think this, um, I don't think OCM should have access to information that the commission doesn't have or have access to. Um, I think that, uh, this 
amendment is designed to put in writing a practice that allows the Commission to exercise oversight over these messages to ensure they're appropriate, and that is our job. Um, I think that uh, these messages, um, if there's a question, um, we should be able to raise it. And I think that clear, clearing these um, statements by OCM uh, for 6B by someone other than the Commission does not thrill me in the least. So I'm, I'm supportive of this. I'm nervous about even calling for additional questions and comments, but are there additional questions and comments? I have one um, question to Commissioner Feldman. What does provide timely updates mean exactly? Are you look, I guess I would ask for what is, what are you looking for in that term? Um, I, I think the, the more important piece of language there is uh, information, but it's my, it's my expectation and hope that the updates would, um, you know, be to provide a, a, a record about the um, facts, data, other information underlying and substantiating any particular safety claim that we may from time to time have a question about. Um, and by the process of putting together that record and memorialization, and it doesn't have to be you know, in the form of a memo or a, 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 a white paper, um, you know, it, it may well be sort of an informal communication in, in the form of a, a, a phone call, um, but I think memorializing exactly what the substantiation is for any particular safety claim is an important step, for, uh, step forward in making sure that uh, this agency is held to the highest standards in terms of accuracy and accountability. I guess my concern, and, and I just do want to just address one point that Commissioner Biacco mentioned, um, that OCM shouldn't have access to information that we don't have. We have access to any information that OCM has information. It's really a question of us picking up the phone and asking EXHR, do you agree with this number? Did, you know, was this in consultation with, or whatever the, the topic is that OCM is putting out? I think for me, um, just generally, I've seen a couple of amendments today, and in particular this one, and, and thankfully the withdrawn on the children's defects, um, that was withdrawn. But trusting staff and understanding there is a process. I mean, with this amendment, I would say, why don't we all seek to understand what the process is first? How does OCM come up with their information? What is the process? Do they just you know, go to their file and pull it, or do they talk to and get checked for the most recent data and the most information and incidents and everything else relevant to whatever the issue is? And I think we're sending a message to staff that you know, that we're questioning and undermining so much of what they're doing. And that concerns me because this agency without the staff, we're just decision makers. They're who keeps, the staff is who keeps this agency running. And, um, and that concerns me we're sending to them, whether it's OCM or anyone else, the wrong message. And that, that's my concern with this amendment. Additional questions or comments? Yeah, I do, because, because I didn't have the same experience um, that you referred to, Commissioner Burkle. There were several times where I didn't get the information that I had requested, or I got it after the information was released to the public, and that isn't acceptable. And so I think that the, this is designed to address that. And we are the decision makers, and the buck stops with us. And so um, I do think we should take that role just as seriously as the staff takes their role to make sure that we're meeting um, uh, all of the appropriate standards, rules, regulations, and commission policies, and we should be given the opportunity to, to ask for it and uh, receive it in a timely manner. To clarify, clarify, but this is not saying that you nothing can go out until it's this update and, and this information has been provided to the commission, because I think I heard something different from Commissioner Biacco. I don't read it that way. But it would provide accountability after the fact and perhaps leading up, up, up to. Uh, the, the, the only sort of temporal qualifier in the language here is that the advice be timely. Sorry, not the advice, the, uh, the, the, the updates the and information. information. Okay, but it wouldn't preclude the information going out because I think the other thing we have to be careful of, our staffs primarily, but all of us witnessed the kinds of hours that went into just coming up with this ops plan and to try to 
reduce everything, every action this commission takes to a commission decision or commission input will paralyze this agency. But it's, it's certainly my hope that the OCM would not be putting out information and rushing to put out releases that contain unsubstantiated safety claims. That's why I introduced the amendment to provide accountability and a, f a fail safe safety check um, that, that we're able to exercise that much more insight and control uh, as to the information that's underpinning safety claims that we make. And I would just reiterate because it's such an important point, I don't believe OCM operates that way. I don't believe anyone in the agency. There is a very, very complicated, and for those who are on the chain who have to review this, do the 6B review that goes through, uh, they will attest to the fact that they're constantly reviewing information so that what we send out is fair and accurate. Yes, but not all safety information and claims that are made by OCM implicate 6B and go through the 6B review process. A lot of it does, a lot of it doesn't. Um. I, I would just weigh in. Uh, I, I have to say that, uh, again, given my respect and uh, affection uh, and need for staff, that uh, I'm afraid this is sending a wrong signal to staff, and so uh, you've persuaded me to switch my vote, and so I'm prepared to do that. Um, are there additional questions or comments before the Commission on this matter? Uh, Commissioner, as Chairman Adler, may I speak? Yes, yeah, sure. I, I just wanted to say that I, I don't agree that it sends any kind of signal, or at least it's intended to send a signal. It shouldn't change anything about existing practice. Every commissioner has the right to pick up the phone and say, hey, I saw you just put out a press release. It's not asking people to um, do a 6B review they haven't done. All it's saying is, hey, I'm not part of that process as a commission office. I see you made the following recommendation. Can you help me understand what the basis of that recommendation is? And so I'm not seeing it as anything other than a uh, putting in writing what the commissioners are entitled to do now. And so it shouldn't change any practice. I am the only one on the dais who sat on, has sat on both sides of the 6B process. I did the 6B review when I was the executive director. I don't think we're talking about whether it's 35 incidents or 40 incidents. I think what we're talking about is when staff says, for the following safety issue, we recommend you do the following things. I cleared plenty of those information and education pieces. And a lot of times as ED, I would say, where did we come up with this idea? Like, so we're suggesting that you take three safety steps in the following hazard scenario. Where did that come from? The same questions that any commissioner might want to ask. The answers varied in the degree of specificity and substantiation. Anywhere from a group of us sat in a room and thought about it, and this is what we thought we should advise, to we hired a contractor and they spent a year researching it and peer reviewing these solutions, and this is what the contractor recommended. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with the commissioner asking to be better informed since we are on the hook for what the agency says. So I think it's part of the normal give and take between the commission offices and the staff. And if everything's working properly and staff has any at the back, I mean, OCM shouldn't want to put out something that's not well justified. So I would think to Commissioner Burkle's point, they're already doing that work. They should be happy to say, thank you for the phone call. I'm glad we were able to get that release out. Here is why we said what we said. The commission office is then hopefully satisfied and we can move on to, and better educated, and we can move on to the next issue. I think you're absolutely right. Yep. Um, th this, this, it is all of our credibilities and our collective credibility uh, that's at stake if and when an unsubstantiated claim uh, were, were to go out of the door. Um, this would not, to your, to your question, uh, change existing practices, but that it would um, indicate clearly that it is a priority um, OCM's response to those commission-driven inquiries for substantiation about safety claims and official releases. I certainly appreciate that thought. Uh, if it's not changing anything, then it feels like a scoldy kind of amendment. And uh, in this case, I would prefer an affirming amendment that says, staff, you're doing a good job. Keep doing the same job you're doing. Um, additional comments or questions? If not, we'll take a vote. Okay, Commissioner Kay, um, excuse me, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Kay? 
without scolding intent, I vote yes. <laughs> okay, so we have to add that as an amendment to your vote. Commissioner Bianco? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote no without an explanation beyond that which I've given. So the amendment passes uh, on a three to two vote. We have now uh, reached the point where I think all amendments are on the table except actually moving to vote on the op plan. And here's where I would make a suggestion that we take a 10 or 15 minute break uh, before we actually have the vote on the op plan. And I just wanted to add that I would be prepared to provide a gold star to the shortest statement from any of the commissioners at the table with respect to the op plan. So uh, at this point, we will take a, a 15 minute break.
Um, so one of the things that uh, we have done uh, and has circulated to the Commission is a list of the amendments that have passed. Um, this will not be absolutely categorically binding, but I'd ask if you would examine it for a few seconds to see if something that you believe uh, failed, passed, or something that passed is not on this list. Um, are we all comfortable with this list? This is not a cast in concrete list, but this is what our, this is our best summary of what the votes have been. Any objections? Okay. Uh, having uh, are there any other amendments or motions at this point before we move to vote on the op plan? Okay. Having heard no further amendments or motions, I will now call for a motion to vote to approve the FY 2020 operating plan as amended. Do I hear a motion? I move to amend to move the uh, operating plan as amended. Thank you. And do we have a second? Thank you. Uh, please note that each commissioner will have 10 minutes for closing remarks after the conclusion of all votes. <laughs> Does anyone else wish to be heard before we vote on the operating plan as amended? Fine. Uh, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Kay, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Biaco, how do you vote? Yes, but I do not. Yes, but I do not intend to ratify um, the uh, footnoted ombuds position uh, as presented. Thank you. With that qualifier, Commissioner Feldman, how do you vote? Yes. And I vote yes. So the yeas are four and the nays are one. The fiscal year 2020 operating plan, as amended, has been approved. We will now have up to 10 minutes per commissioner for any closing remarks, and I will begin. And let me start by apologizing profusely to Commissioner Biaco for consistently missing her uh, during the uh, proceedings. Please understand there's nothing personal. It's just my own incredible incompetence, and so uh, I, I beg your forgiveness on that. Uh, I want to thank uh, the members of the Commission for showing that when the Sunshine Act calls for public deliberation, we actually deliberated today. And I'm very proud of what we've done. Uh, I don't know if we set a world record for the length of Commission meetings, but we've certainly, we're certainly up there in the very top of Commission meetings. And I think that the degree of cordiality was uh, impressive. I think people disagreed without being disagreeable, and so I thank you all for that, that, that really commendable job. Of course, we have to thank the Commission staff for all the hard work they put into the op plan. I don't think the fact that there were so many amendments in any way suggests there's any deficiency in the op plan. It just shows how engaged and how strong the feelings are of the Commission, um, particularly uh, the Duanes. Uh, Dwayne Ray and Dwayne Boniface and Jay Hoffman and James uh, uh, Baker. Baker, thank you. I, um, and I also particularly want to thank uh, the commissioner's personal staffs for extraordinary work behind the scenes. And I say that as somebody who was a special assistant for years and then was also a staff assistant on the Hill. Uh, you have no idea how much hard work went into this and how many meetings. And here, forgive me, uh, I want to single out uh, uh, my Chief of Staff, Sarah Klein, hereafter known as the Queen of Collaboration, Conciliation, and Compromise. Uh, I think that this uh, is a reflection of tremendous involvement of all the Commissioner staff, and I want to thank everybody for that. Um, I hate many of the things that are agreed to in the amendments uh, to the OP plan. And uh, I'm going to issue a statement with respect to one or two of the things that I hate. But I love the idea that we have come together, all of us swallowing amendments that we do not like and believe put the commission, at least in some respects, in a bad direction. 
but when the dust settles, I am very proud that we have approved an op plan and that the staff now has an understanding of steps forward. Uh, and with that, I have nothing further to say except again to thank all of my colleagues for their very hard work today. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you very much. And I just want to uh, echo uh, Acting Chair's um, comments about um, my appreciation and thank you to the staff putting together the document and then being available for the multitude of questions that uh, followed and the clarification and all of the work that you did. Thank you. Um, what I said earlier, I truly mean the staff here at CPSC is the heart and soul of this agency. So thank you very much for all of your hard work. <clears throat> I also want to thank, again, as um, Acting Chair mentioned, our commission staffs spent hours and hours and hours in fishbowls and really, um, really worked very hard to get us to where we are today. And I also want to uh, single out Jen Feinberg and Sarah Klein because they, and Mo, um, not only are they queen of collaboration and compromise, but graphics. So I want to thank them uh, for keeping all of the kittens in the box, doing what needed to get done to get us here today, because it's very important this agency has an ops plan. And to Bob's point, I agree, I disagree. We had some really robust, good discussions up here, but at the end of the day, it's very, very important that we know what direction the agency is going to head in, and that's what this op plan does today. I feel like um, this is my seventh ops plan, if you can imagine that. But I do feel like the agency is being left in a good place, a better place, and in the hands of, of Acting Chairman Adler, I want to wish him well, as well as all of my colleagues. And so I think that's all I have to say. I will be issuing a statement to, uh, to Bob's point just with regards to some of the things I loved and some of the things I don't love. So thank you very much, and uh, I yield. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you as well to the commission staff, to the staff at the agency, as well as to our personal office staffs. And I agree completely mm. with the comments that were made about um, Ms. Klein, Ms. Feinberg, and uh, Ms. Kentoff, that uh, just a tremendous job by your office. In seeing everything through, uh, I will issue a formal statement or a longer statement to discuss the reasons for opposing the operating plan and what the big hurdles for me were, mm. but instead of spending time on that what, I want to spend a little bit more time on, on a who. And uh, when we all become put in positions of responsibility, we all feel like, and I'm, I think Commissioner Chairman Adler is going to do this right now, where you want to put your own touches on things. And when I became uh, chair of the agency, one of the things that I wanted to do was to try to make the discussion at the dais a little bit more formal and go with titles and the uh, proper names of the individual staffers who were before us. Not that there was anything wrong with the way that it had been done, but I felt like the agency should take that next leap forward and, and treat its staff in particular at a more formal level. So I've not, when I've discussed my colleagues at the dais, talked about them in, in their first person form, but I do want to deviate from that practice for a moment and talk about Anne Marie. And when Anne Marie was appointed in July of 2013, I think it's safe to say that the commission at that point was not um, at its best in terms of how people got along at the commission level. And it broke down significantly along party lines as a result of the terrible slog of implementing the difficult issues that Congress punted to the agency in the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. And that slog took its toll on the then commission at the time. And so there was a lot of uh, distrust and bad will that existed along partisan lines. So when we got the names, that when we found out that uh, Commissioner Burkle and Commissioner Robinson were approved, at that point I was the chief of staff to Chairman Tenenbaum. And I did not ask her, I just, which was actually not abnormal, I just went ahead and did something that I thought, even if she didn't want me doing, I knew she would be okay with in the end. And I called both Commissioner Robinson and Commissioner Burkle 
and explained who I was, left messages for both of them, explained who I was, and offered the full assistance of the chairman's office, Chairman Tenenbaum's staff, and Chairman Tenenbaum in welcoming both Commissioner Robinson and Commissioner Burkle to the agency. And at that point, I remember that Anne Marie called me back. And I think that it's fair to say that there is probably um, misconceptions about people's reputations and concerns about the agency's reputation and how people would get along at a partisan level. And so I, I credit Anne Marie for calling me back. And really, I don't know if she likes this admitted publicly, but I was pretty much her first staffer because that was before Nancy and before Caitlin and really Dottie, who's now Dottie Yara, then was Dottie Lee, work, who works for Commissioner Bayako. Dottie, who was Chairman Tenenbaum's, uh, on Chairman Tenenbaum's staff with us, Dottie assisted with sort of the admin side of getting both offices off the ground. And I assisted with the trying to help with the substance. And I felt like my job was to be an honest broker. And actually, the op plan, I think, was coming up pretty soon <laughs> after when you got here. And I remember sitting with Anne Marie, and we went through the issues, and that's where the famous phthalates moment happened, where I explained to Anne Marie how to pronounce it, because I was concerned that if she didn't get some guidance, she would say phthalates. And so we talked about that, and I went through and I gave her a very candid assessment of the issues from both sides and of the various stakeholders, sort of who she would probably be more likely to find common ground with, who she could feel like was an honest broker on the other side, and, and how it would all work. And I think that the, that was important for establishing a foundation of us having that goodwill to work from. And I remember Anne Marie approved me becoming the executive director right before Inez left. And then Anne Marie was one of the first people that I told that I was the nominee for chair. And I asked Anne Marie to come up to my office, the executive director's office, which is now Mary Boyle's office. And we sat around the table, and she had no idea why I wanted to see her. And she was on one side of the table and I was on the other. And when I told her, I don't know if you remember this, she said, yay me, and got up and came around and gave me a hug. Be and to me, that was a reflection of the goodwill that we had built back and forth. Now that goodwill, no doubt, has been tested throughout the entire time that we've served together on the commission. It's been strained at times. We've gone through periods of, of uh, having better relations, of having difficult relations. But we've stuck through it. And I can tell you, we, we ended up serving in, the, in 724 for, I think, around the same amount of time, pretty close. And I'm not going to say that the chairman job is, not, is, is set up to fail. I don't think that's right. But I don't also, I think Anne-Marie would agree with me, I don't think it's really set up to succeed either. And that's probably intentional by Congress. But there's a human being who has to occupy that seat. And that inability to have things function, except on the rarest of great days, which is very rare, but that inability to have things function smoothly and to deal with the commission environment and the issues that come up with the resource limitations we have and the difficult questions that Congress gives to us, that takes its toll. There is just no doubt about it. It is a very, very heavy responsibility. It's a very lonely position. And despite the great staff work, both from the agency staff and your own staff, nobody could fully understand what it feels like to sit in that seat and bear that burden day after day. And unless you've sat in that seat and, and borne that burden. And so I am so impressed with how Anne Marie led, endured very difficult conditions. We all have our unique challenges and personalities during our times, internal, external, from wherever they come from. And Anne Marie was so steady and always kept a human element to how she did everything, was always true to who she is as a person and always represented the best of herself during it. We may not have agreed on the substance, but I always knew 
that Anne Marie was giving it everything she got, she had, and was trying to truly make the best decision she could under the circumstances. And I, we may not, like I said, we may not have agreed on the outcome, but I think that that's what you could hope for, for somebody in that position of heavy responsibility. So I hope we can all, as Anne Marie leaves, uh, express our gratitude in our own way. And I wanted to just say how much I appreciate the service that and the sacrifice that you've endured. And I really do understand what it's like. Thank you. Um, I was taking careful notes about the burdens of the chairmanship. Uh, Commissioner Biacco, <laughs> your closing comments. Thank you. Well, that's, that's tough to follow. So let me just, um, uh, I agree certainly with um, uh, Elliot's remarks, Anne-Marie, and yeah, I, I found your professionalism on this dais exemplary. I had a statement drafted, but I changed my mind. So I will rewrite it and issue it. Um, I am encouraged. Um, excited about <coughs> excuse me everything we accomplished today I believe that all commissioners should have projects in the op plan that promotes their initiatives and their views um, I think it makes the agency stronger and I think today um, we accomplished that and so um, I'm excited about that thanks to my staff uh, particularly Dottie Yar who I would have never gotten through today without. And um, to, to all of you guys and the staff who answered my countless questions, particularly James Baker, thank you for that. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for working so hard together. I think that um, today demonstrated that we should do more of this. Uh, the, the Sunshine Act, I think, um, should not preclude us from deliberating and deliberating in public because I think we all have something that, that's important to say. And uh, many of you changed my mind um, on many issues today uh, through deliberations and perspectives that I didn't have. Um, and, and that's a good thing. So that's it. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. And I would associate myself with many of the remarks that were made on the dais uh, uh, today. Uh, and, and for the sake of brevity, I'm, I'm going to introduce a longer statement for the record. Um, today we met, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased that my fellow commissioners found common ground to define the agency priorities, to advance our safety mission, and to clearly communicate to the taxpayers how we intend to use the precious resources that we've been provided. Um, I want to thank uh, my fellow commissioners and Acting Chairman Adler and, and his staff in particular uh, for the hard work on the operating plan. I'd like to re recognize the work of Teddy Tanzer on my staff for his, his uh, invaluable contributions in the process. And I'd also like to thank the career agency staff for the hard work that they did in putting together this document. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'll, I'll limit my remarks to that and submit uh, a, a more fulsome uh, comments for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes the public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Thank you all. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>